This is Dave Tate from Elite FTS. Last year, we partnered with Ken Kanak and to co-host the Swiss Symposium. It's built on hypertrophy and sport medicine for strength athletes and practitioners to come together in one place, which will be the Columbus Hilton at Easton. You are going to learn how to level up your training based upon the success and failures of others. You have to stay on top of your game if you want to be able to make the success and move forward at the pace that you want. Just to name a few of the presenters that will be presenting. We're going to have Matt Winning, Brian Carroll, Eric Serrano, Jim Wendler. That's just a few. These experts will be presenting on low back injury and prevention, exercise selection, as well as a business steroid recovery and restoration panel. If you want to network with one of the experts that we have presenting, we're going to have people there to be able to help you do that. To register for the Swiss Symposium, go to the EliteFTS.com website, look for the banner on the home page, click that, and we'll see you there. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. One of the ways that you can support the podcast is by purchasing or picking up our limited edition apparel. The shirt that I have on right now is one of the only shirts that we've brought back for a second time. Normally, we'll never do that, but the only reason we brought this one back for a second time is it sold out within six hours. So we brought this one back. We also got a second one that we just dropped. It's our, I guess, just Halloween edition shirt. Go to leadfts.com or go to the link in the description. This really does help us out because this directly supports the Table Talk podcast. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the show. All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Why do, how, do, how do your quads cramp doing seated leg curls? But it was a reminder to me that I need element before my heavy training sessions, not just on days when I'm sweating like crazy or it's super hot outside, but there's something with their ratio of sodium, magnesium, and potassium, their scientifically backed ratio, however they explain that, that makes a huge difference with my training. Every morning I mix it in my oatmeal with, you know, protein and the other crap I mix it with. So I get a half a pack there every morning easy and it actually makes the oatmeal taste better. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk. When you go through that link, you'll get a free sample pack of all the different flavors. So maybe you think you might not like the grapefruit. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe you think you're not going to like the chocolate. I thought it was going to be awful, but it was in the sample pack. And then somebody gave me the idea to throw it in oatmeal. And it was like a game changer to my oatmeal as far as how the oatmeal tastes. The sample pack will allow you to test flavors to see what you like and what you don't like. So head over to Element. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome. 
to Table Talk. All right, what's up, guys? We're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is Laura Phelps Stackhouse. She has a lot of accolades. So I'm just going to say, because I looked yesterday just to double check, you still have the highest dots of all time. You still have the highest Wilkes of all time. You have the highest coefficients of all time for all of them except one, but I don't even know what that one is. I so I don't know how it's made, right? right. So that stands your. You competed for a decade, you've had 45 all-time world records, you still hold five. We are going to talk about your competitive background, but, and I don't want to make you feel old, that was a while ago. Yeah. You've done a whole lot since then, which I'm more interested in talking yeah. about, which is more the coaching side, right. uh, building the pro-am to what it is now, the ups and downs that have been associated with that, yeah. and, the, um, and the lifters that you've produced. You know, it's... You get so far away from all this, certain things become more impressive. Yeah. I'm more impressed with the lifters than you produced than the lifting you did, even though the lifting that you did was fucking amazing yeah. to be able to watch and and see that because it was during the WPO. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, before that, I like to kind of go through your your timeline and your background and I'm just going to touch on it a little bit. I'll let you expand, right? Because you've already told it many times, yeah. right? So <laughs> you were a gymnast growing up, mm -hmm. I believe from, test my memory here, from four to 14. And then in high school, yeah. you still were the gymnast, but you only did floor. Floor and vault. Floor, yeah. floor and vault. So you specialized there. Yeah. I think this is important, and I'm sure you'll agree as a coach now, because it's laying the foundation for the explosive strength. Absolutely. You know, that is developed at very young ages. Right. So when people say, oh, she's a genetic freak, I'm like, ah, there are some other components. Right. You know, when all you're doing is bounding and leaping Absolutely. and jumping and doing explosive work from right. the age of Building four. that tendon thickness and body awareness and flexibility, you know, it really yeah. did lay the foundation for... And during, during that time period, you know, weight training was not really associated. Right. It was just all bounding, just plyometric exactly. type work. body weight stuff. Yeah. Then, then when you went to college, there is a question I have here because you went to Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Was that in sport management? What was the specialty? Actually, when I was at Ohio State, I was undecided. I was completely just overwhelmed by the size of the, the campus and the amount of people. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't really have a passion for fitness yet, even though I, you know, been doing organized sports and I was into it, but, um, I just kind of got a little overwhelmed and, you know, everything was so big. So I ended up transferring my junior year to Bowling Green and then, um, majored in health promotion. So then I was like, okay, this isn't necessarily fitness related. I was more into like the corporate wellness area. So that's where I finished out and got my degree there as in um, health promotion. Health promotion. When I, and I don't I, even know what that well, means. Well, I was really. there for a while and it was, and I remember the tracks that were, because there was kind of like the exercise science track, but then there was, it wasn't health promotion, but it probably was the same yeah. thing. So all I, all I remember is oh, so I can manage a health club. I mean, that's like right. what the end result of this exactly. was. Yeah. And then so that I skedaddled out of there and went to Toledo so I could independently yeah. create something that was more around strength and conditioning. Mm -hmm. So you get through college and then your first job is health promotion. Yeah. For... I worked at General Motors in Toledo, actually, um, you know, kind of stayed up in that area. And I worked at General Motors in the fitness center there. And at that time, I really still did not know much about weightlifting. That's kind of where I learned was in that weight room. I was, you know, manage, I was, you know, working the the desk there, you know, helping people get through exercises, but I wasn't in charge of any, wasn't, I wasn't personal training or anything, but I started to dabble in it myself. I was like, okay, if I'm working working in this, this gym. And I worked like the weird shift. I worked like 11 a.m., 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Oh, and then some like morning shifts is the most bizarre schedule. Um, but I started doing some lifting and getting into that, but it was bodybuilding. It wasn't powerlifting. 
you know. Well, it is a weird shift, but it was GM as well. Yeah. So they're 24 it, they're, hours. Yeah. So they're yeah. 24. How many people were coming in? There, I mean, there, at any given time, there could be 10 to 20 people in the mm -hmm. fitness center. Um, and they all kind of, you know, would get on the elliptical and, you know, they kind of did their own thing with some questions here and there. Um, but then once I started learning more about bodybuilding, then I started being able to help them more and like create some programs, give suggestions. Uh, but I was more into the bodybuilding realm because I, you know, met people that were into body, but Toledo for some reason was like a really, at that time was really into, was really big for bodybuilding. This was, um, 2003, mm -hmm. you know, so I got into bodybuilding. Then I joined the powerhouse gym there, big time bodybuilding gym and did three bodybuilding shows. Which powerhouse? It was on, um, I mean, it was there. I actually kind of went to both. There was two at the time, mm -hmm. but the one that was on Secor, maybe Secor, because yeah. one of them used to be when I was there was Car's Body Shop, yeah, and then it, I think it was Gold Gym, maybe. And then it right. went into, but that was like a, a seed mm -hmm. for the the best bodybuilders, yeah. And then I guess there was Hard Bodies, which was in Maumee too. That was a little bit older too. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so I was intrigued when knowing that you were from Toledo because I kind of know that, that those area, areas, yeah. right? Because it's <clears throat> just from the powerlifting, well, the bodybuilding thing was kind of easy. There was like two places that you went. Yeah. And that's why I went into bodybuilding when I went to Bowling Green because I couldn't find any powerlifters. Yeah. And it kind of sucked because that was my background. And then, ah, try this. Yeah. And it was in Maumee, so it was at Hard Bodies. But then I started to find powerlifters again. It's like, oh, okay, they're over here at Cars or they're over here at um, Flex Connection, which used yeah, to be. Yeah, yeah, I know, remember so that. Jim, yeah. Jim Mominy. Jimmy Mominy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he was a bencher that turned bodybuilder mm -hmm. that turned pro bodybuilder. and But he had a, a group of people. Um, Bob Wall was there. Mm -hmm. Some other, George Crawford was even there right. for a while. So that's who I was able to learn from. This is all pre Louis too. Yeah. So this is why it was easier for me to kind of learn from Louis because George Crawford and these guys are all kind of whack too, yeah. you know. And and well, technicians, super technicians. For sure. And then there was like Dave Harless and. My gosh, uh, I trained Heffern. a lot with um, Dave Harless. Yeah. yeah. So that would be that that he was in the. The golds or whatever, right. the, the cars, I, I think it's all mixed up. Yeah. So I would go over there and train with him and Paul, which was just super, super heavy, ridiculously yeah. heavy. Yeah. I still can't tell you what their training methodology was, except put all your shit on and go heavy. Yeah, definitely. But it, <laughs> it worked. And then I would go over with um, Bob and Jim Omini, and then it was technique, technique, technique. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of doing max effort and speed. I, in a weird way, you know, I had a technical day. Yeah. I was kind of like going back and forth. And um, so I've always kind of wondered like how the demographics moved around there. Because right. now Toledo's got a bunch of powerlifting yeah. gyms. I don't know what they, do. what they all are now. Yeah, I don't know. So bodybuilding is where you fell in. <laughs> so your, your story kind of mirrors mine, which is yeah. really kind of weird. <laughs> Go to college, don't what I want to do. Don't yeah. know what I, except I flunked out. So I went in, I flunked out, not knowing what I wanted to do. Then it was like, I can't take any more classes. I'm going to fail. So I just go to the bookstore and I would scour all the books and then only take classes of books that I actually knew I would read and like. Right, right. I did that for four years. Did you get the degree? I I had enough. <laughs> this is when I was dating Tracy at the time. So I had enough credits to graduate. So she is like, what, what will you graduate in? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. know. I'm just here to lift, <laughs> right, man. I'm right. just, you know, I'm paying for school with the other stuff I'm doing. So I went to every college on campus. You know, how you had little check sheet things. Yeah. And I was one class away from from a sociology degree. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. All right. But it was a foreign language. In Bowling Green, it was a foreign language, and there was no way around it. I don't like to say I can't do things, but I couldn't do it yeah. because I had to learn how to spell it, how to speak it, and then how to write. It's like three classes in one, and my brain just would have- So hard, yeah. Because yeah. all through college, I never took more than two classes at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, training was part of it, yeah. but that's really all I could digest yeah. and do well in. So then my grade point was high enough because that was the other problem. I couldn't transfer because I had a 0.75 grade point average. Oh, my gosh. So I couldn't transfer until I was a 2.5. Now it was high enough that I go to Toledo. I'm like, okay, we're starting all over again. Here's a guidance counselor. I didn't know they existed, by the way. And um, then we mapped it out. Then 
4.0 all the way wow, so like, yeah because i knew what i it's like i want to do this this is interesting to me right so i lived in that bowling green toledo paris i lived in perrysburg mm -hmm. because it was halfway yeah then i'd work in detroit sometimes too so it was in firing distance of everything yeah and then when i'd make the trips to west side towards the back end of my college days it was a bigger trip you know obviously away with like two and a half two hours or something mm -hmm. but not as bad as you know detroit yeah you know which is a little bit faster right so same thing with the college you're bouncing around because you can't figure out what to do then i'm in kind of corporate fitness after that and but end up in the same area and have to bodybuild because i can't find anything else what got you into the bodybuilding um well, when I was training at Powerhouse Gym, there was a couple guys there that must have been into powerlifting because they saw that even though I was training for bodybuilding, I liked to go heavy. So mm -hmm. I would always go heavy on bench press, deadlift. I didn't really, it's funny because I never went heavy on squat. I really actually never squatted. I always did heavy leg press and things like that. So I remember this one guy was like, there's a local push pull meet it was i think at the mall there was like it was, well i mean it was like <laughs> it's the, the, the in bowling context mall. right yeah, yeah yeah it was like empty so yeah. it was like an empty department store well let's like let's let's put some context <laughs> out there too that would have been a big deal back yeah, then yeah yeah in I a mean, mall it, i mean it, it there was better a than a high spectators. school like <laughs> yeah. it was actually like a, it was awesome like, yeah <laughs> more spectators there than i've seen at most power league yeah. meets here so um it was actually really cool and jimmy momini was on mm -hmm. was announcing so that was my the first time i had met him and he really gave me a lot of tips he was like i was wearing my like running shoes to deadlift mm -hmm. and he was like maybe like on your next attempt take those off just go barefoot and um you know so he that's when i started you know kind of talking to him and you know learning more about powerlifting but i was not into powerlifting i still was planning on doing the gnc body rock um 2004 in the summer that was i was like that was my biggest goal because that was the biggest um bodybuilding competition that I was going to be prepared for everything else was local. So I was training for that and just doing the power lifts to help build some thickness. I was mm -hmm. small. Like when I was on stage, I was like 120 pounds, you know, so yeah. I wasn't like a big bodybuilder and there was no physique at the time. It was literally just figure fitness and bodybuilding. So, you mm -hmm. know, I was just like, well, I'm going to do bodybuilding. Um, so, you know, I did a couple of those. There were, that was actually pretty popular back then was those, the little non-sanctioned push pull mm -hmm. meets, you know, which I think actually would be fun to do more of around, you know, like just to get people into it. Cause that got me into it. It mm -hmm. was super fun. No pressure. Didn't have to wear singlets and didn't have to squat and do all that. You they're know, quick too. yeah, they're quick. They're super mm -hmm. quick. And, um, did a couple of those and then did that comp that bodybuilding show in the summer. And I won my, um, I actually won the whole overall as a lightweight and thought for sure. Cause I met some, you know, big wig type of people there that were like, you know, get ready, do these bigger shows. And I was like, all right, I'm going to like get ready for all that. Um, but then something just kind of pulled me away. I started meeting some more people. I met a couple of people at the powerhouse gym that were my original powerlifting training partners, uh, Brian Urist and Todd Greniger. And they were like, they were real powerlifters. They were getting, you know, in equipment and bench shirts and squat suits and stuff. And cause that, you know, I say this all the time, but back then that was just what you did. You didn't yeah. like, Oh, I'm going to start off raw. And then, you know, it, it, that's what it was, is multiply. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they were, they were doing all of that. And I still wasn't planning on retiring from bodybuilder retiring, but, um, I just was like, Oh, I should do this for fun. I'll, I'll do this meet with them. There was a meet going on, um, in the summer of 2005 in Chicago um, it was an APF me because APF was like the big thing then. And I was like, I'll do that with you guys. But so they weren't screwing around. They took no, they you to a pretty big meet. Yeah. They're like, the we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to do this. And, um, I actually, when I was working at General Motors, there was a, a guy that worked out there. He was, you know, in his fifties or so. And he's like, my nephew owns a gym in Detroit and it was called, um, total flex. It was in Southgate, Michigan, and he was a power lifter. He did bench press only, but apparently um, they had like a little area of that gym that was power lifting. It was called penitentiary power lifting because they had like these bars, mm -hmm. you know, it looked like a, like a prison cell. And that's where like the power, the real serious people worked out in um, Fabian Wamscans and mm -hmm. Paul Urchin, Paul, yeah, yeah, Paul. Tony Butson, they all trained there. I didn't know them, but 
when um, the guy that I knew put me in touch with his nephew that owned yeah. the gym, he was like, come up, you know, we've got some lifters that do full power. They can help you. Cause I had no clue. I mean, I didn't, I didn't own any, I did order a pair of metal briefs at the time mm -hmm. and I had, so I had some briefs and that's it. I didn't have anything else. But when I went up there, I took a squat. I remember taking a squat in Paul wrap my knees. Yeah. That's the first time I'd had my, like a real knee wrap. And I was just like, Oh my God. But I, I remember squatting like 480 that day. And I was just like, this is awesome. And he went out to his car. He had a, a, a Leviathan and he was like, you know, try this. Um, it fit perfectly. It was tight, but it fit perfectly. And I just started going up on the weekends and we would just max out you know, full gear That's pretty <laughs> max much, yeah, out. Yeah. And I literally would just like about every Saturday, I would go up like maybe 20 pounds every Saturday until it was like, now I'm in the fives, you know, and then the sixes. Well, actually by the time the meet came in June, that meet that I'd signed up for, I was in the fives. Cause I remember I squatted, um, 551 benched 309, I think, and then deadlifted four. 40 something. Um, but all of that was just hand-me-down gear. I did actually buy a Ben shirt. I bought a Ben shirt. I was wearing a Rage X at the time. And, um, you know, all of that was just like kind of hand-me-down gear. And after that, I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. Cause I was like, it was like 551 and the world record at the time was 611. And in my mind, I was like, I'm close. You know, I mean, nowadays I'd be like, are you crazy? Like that's going to take you years. But I was like, no, the rate I'm going, cause I'm just maxing out every weekend. I was like, I'm going to be at that six whatever the next kilo was 617 I'm going to be there like in a few months, you know, which is just insane to think of. But, um, at that time I was just like, I'm just going to put bodybuilding on the back burner and I'm just going to focus on, on powerlifting. Now were, were any of these sessions, were you, were you training with Paul or were, yeah, was he around? We were training okay. together all the time. We well, are bringing back memories now. Cause yeah. I first met Paul when I was competing in high school. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so in, he's since passed, right. but would <clears throat> he would be at all the meets I would go to because yeah. back then we did a lot of meets. And <clears throat> the way that I always kind of remembered him is he always had on the the flag Zubaz yeah, yeah. pants. Oh, so yeah. my question is, was he wearing the flag Zubaz? I think he pants? was past that. That was, that, that was pre. Cause it was like, everywhere. Was there, yeah. And it was, it was, it was weird because when I, when I started making the trips to West side later, there was probably I may be overextending how long this was, a decade of Paul and Chuck yeah. going back right. to back. I mean, it was a right. battle, yeah. you know, of them going back to back. And then, you know, Chuck went up, but mm -hmm. I believe Paul was older yeah. too. And Paul, that one of the, God, there's so many funny things I can say about Paul <laughs> is <clears throat> when he, when he got a little older, he was in, we were both in one of the nationals or whatever it was. And I asked him afterwards, you know, how'd the me go? And he said, no injuries. So it went real well. And it resonated with me because he got hurt. All the time. All the yeah, time. Yeah. And he was just so happy that he went through a whole meet. <laughs> right. And Did nothing, blow something nothing off. Yeah. blew off, <laughs> which was... <clears throat> Which is amazing, but those are great people to be around oh, because yeah. I mean, I've, I've the just, intensity. Yeah, I was so fortunate that that was my introduction into powerlifting because these guys, they did a few more meets after I started training there, but they were kind of at the end of their career. So they had so, they invested so much of their time and energy into me. Cause you know, I just brought like this fresh, like blood into the gym and they just loved like kind of the potential that they could see in me. So they invested a lot of time and effort and it was the best. I mean, they taught me technique and yeah, like the intensity. I, I remember, you know, going for a squat. Cause like I said, this is before I knew anything about training, we were just like max out. And I remember getting ready to do like a full gear squat and Fabian comes over with this like manila folder and he opens it up and it's a picture of, um, I think it was a picture of Shannon Hartnett. I, I don't, or someone that like had the world record or yeah. whatever. Um, and he was trying to like get in my head, but like little did he know, like, I, I just am a different, I'm more an intrinsic person. Like I'm competing against myself. Like that kind of stuff doesn't really get me like yeah. jazzed up, you know, but it was so cool. Cause he just, I mean, he went to all my meets and Fabian definitely for sure, you know, believed in me so much. I mean, I still talk to him this day. It was his birthday the other day and, um, they had a big part in kind of just making, I don't know, just that start to my career. The Chicago so meet kind of makes sense now. Was it yeah. one of Ernie's meets? It was actually Eric Stone. It was like his first meet he yeah. had ever put on. So I bet he probably took it over from Ernie and, um, you know, so it was his first meet that he ever put on. Yeah. Cause I believe Paul started to make a lot of trips yeah. 
to France because yeah. that's when his squats started to go up too because yeah. they started dialing in the canvas when it was the diaper suit. Right. You yeah. know, they were going there and just making yeah. unbelievable progress. Yeah, he loved that France suit. And I think that's why he gave me the Leviathan because he <laughs> yeah. just didn't like it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was probably too, just too much suit for him. Yeah. And I'm like, this is awesome. You know, my legs are like turning purple and it took like three guys to get this thing off of me every time I wore it. Um, but I loved it. Yeah, he was trying to explain to me once that because they were they were making them trips and the, their squats kept going up. He's trying to explain, and this is back then. Louis was all against the canvas suit, yeah. So as okay. yeah, so it's I was one of the early adopters there, which caught a lot of shit. But anyhow, it, Paul was kind of part of that. Like yeah. you need to do this, you need to do this. But then every time they would make a trip up there, Ernie was changing the gear you know, over and over. And I kept thinking, I, this sucks because I wasn't at West. Side. Well, I think at that time I was, I'm like, I'm, there's no way I can go there yeah. and squat and then come back and live a normal life in the gym right. for at least two months, yeah. <laughs> you know, even if it did help. Yeah. But it was, it's, you came in at a really good time yeah. from the gear because, especially with those guys too, because they already kind of lived through all the stupid shit. Mm -hmm. And learned how to kind of, I'm going to say back off in a, in a smart way. Yeah. They're still probably doing way too much. From what we know now, yeah. they're still doing way too much, but it was way less yeah. than what they used to be doing. Totally. And they, and they loved the advancements in gear because it kept them lifting longer. You yeah. Know, they were able to, to keep competing. I mean, I think Fabian's last meet, he was... 67 or yeah. something, you know, and he still lifted a lot of weight, you know, oh, yeah. he still squatted 700 pounds and deadlifted in the sixes, you know, even at that age. And he yeah. wasn't a big guy. He might have been like the first meet I ever did. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, it's how long he's been around. Right. It's right. Unbelievable how yeah. long he's been around. Yeah. So, God, I can talk about this forever. <laughs> so, and somehow this ended up pivoting into the WPO. So, how did that happen? You did. You, how many meets did you do before the WPO? I only did that the first one in June, um, and then I did a meet in August, so two months later, um, up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, another APF meet, and I think and then I squatted five eighty, so I bumped it up like thirty pounds. I benched, I think I maybe put ten or fifteen pounds on my bench, and I might have even taken a token deadlift. I can't remember why. Um, and then after that, I was like, okay, 580, that's even closer to 611. So I heard, you know, being around Paul and, yeah. and Fabian, and then they were like, the WPO is the pinnacle of meets. Like, that's where everybody's trying to go. Like, at that time, it was really cool because, I mean, everybody was trying to get there. And women were just guest lifters. And it was typically like kind of the same women. It was Amy and Becca and Kara Bohegan and Julie Scanlon and, um, like four or five. Yeah. 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 That were the top lifters. And I, they, I don't know, I didn't know any of them, but I heard Kara Bohegan was hurt and had to pull out of the meet. So I emailed uh, Karen Kidder mm -hmm. and I just said, you know, I, I'm, this is what I've done in a short time. And I'm really confident that I want to go for the all time world record. And I would love to do it at the semifinals, which was happening at the end of September. It was only a month and a half mm -hmm. later. And I just was like, there's no way he's going to write me back. And he did. He wrote back and he was like, okay, let's, let's Where were it. the semis? They were in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. They were in Chicago. So he let, he said that I could do it. And I was like, all right, let's go. So I had, you know, again, still kept like kind of getting those beginner gains in the equipment. And I was like, I was squatting over 600 at the time and in training. And I was like, going to go for it. And at the, at the meet, it was the warm ups were rough. Like it was, you know, I warm up one plate, two plate, three plate. I get my suit on eventually, and I have one more warm up warm up attempt that I can take. And in the warm up area, it was like star studded powerlifting warm up area. Everybody was there, and all the West Side guys, people that you know I'd only kind of heard about or seen in in the West Side videos. And you know, this is still a time. This is two thousand five. There's no um. I don't even really think Facebook was a thing. Definitely not Instagram. Um, maybe YouTube. I can't even remember if YouTube was a thing, but you, the only way of knowing what people were doing was maybe if somebody would embed a video on yeah. a forum, you know, and that took, that was a pain yeah. to embed a video. And so I had no clue what anybody was doing. And uh, Metal Militia would put out those DVDs. It was like 
like a newsletter kind of, of like what was going on. Yeah. Bird, like I got put on that. That was really cool. Um, but you know, the warm up area was intense. Like it was, the intensity was, it was crazy. So I just had never experienced that. And the nerves kind of got to me. I had one more warm up attempt and I pick it up and I hear Louie like cheer for me. And I was like, I just like dropped like a ton of bricks. I went down and just didn't come up. And so I was like, I, I remember looking at Fabian. I was like, can I try that again? I, can I do that again? Like, you know, I need to be able to hit that before I go out there. And he's like, you don't have time. You know, and it was for some reason, I can't remember what happened with the venue. They had to move it somewhere. So the warm up area was like a quarter mile away. I mean, it was in the same building, but it was so far away. Mm -hmm. So we had to get out there to the, to the actual room where the meet was at. And so I didn't have any time. So I was just like, I am about to bomb out in like the biggest meet. What ever was the weight right that now. you missed in the warm up? Right? It was like 565, mm -hmm. and I was going to be opening. Opening was 617. You know, anybody now that I coach, if they were like, I'm, you know, I've only ever squatted 580 in a meet. I want to open with 617, the world record. Like, I'd be like, <laughs> no, you open it with like 580, like, yeah. you know, and then we'll like, you know, yeah. maybe try the 617 on the second, you know, but that's just how much belief that they had in me. They were like, you're going to do it, you know, and um, they were not even worried that I, you know, just missed that. They knew it was just nerves. And so, you know, go open up with 617. It was super easy. Went 661, got that super easy, went 683 and I got that. And then for some reason, I was just thinking about this and I'm like, how did I get a fourth attempt? I tried for 705. I missed it at the top, but I was thinking it was like the WPO was not like a world championship, right? You know, now the rules are really, yeah. you know, strict about that. But anyway, I got a fourth attempt and um, just barely missed it. So I was just like, dang, like I only ever squatted around 600 and I just basically almost squatted 700. In a I think they allowed fourth for all time world records. Yeah. 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 But, and you had to be within X number of pounds. Uh, so I can, what was the second? My second was 661 and they went 683 and I got that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It was so it would be less yeah. than 20 pounds more. Yeah. So that probably is why. Yeah. Now it did, it, it, went, it shouldn't have counted towards your total. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. And I missed it anyway, but you know, so I ended up with 683 and um, things just really changed. You know, everybody took notice and I remember getting sponsored by Inzer right after that and uh, literally at the meet, some, one of their representatives was there and they offered me a sponsorship and I met Louie. I had met Louie before, like just, he had done a bench press seminar at, oddly enough, at a USAPL bench press meet up in Cleveland. Oh my he was God, giving, you like, were there? Same, yeah. Yeah. I went to that. I traveled there. I was like, I'm going to go hear what he has to say about bench press. And so I kind of met him there. Have you heard the backstory of that no. one? No. Okay. Okay. Anyhow, continue. <laughs> yeah, continue. Yeah. I'll tell you when you're done. Yeah. But I met him there <clears> and then I, um, so I met him formally then again at the meet and, you know, he was very much like, you know, you should come out and try mm. and train. At that time I was living in Toledo and I was like, that's a two hour drive and, um, started training with Jason Fry actually, cause he lived in Fremont or Finley. Yeah. So it was like n not too far from Toledo. So mm -hmm. we started meeting up to train for bench press and he was like, you should come with me down there to train. So I went with him once and Louie was like, you know, offered me however you want to put it, like the to join the team or yeah. like could train at West Side. And I was like, and you know, obviously most people would be like, yes, like, you know, no questions. That's why I was like, and I can't believe I did this, but I was like, I need to talk to my training partners first. I, you know, I had such a mm -hmm. loyalty to them. I was worried that they would be upset or whatever. Of course, Fabian, yeah. Paul, and then they were like, go, you gotta go, um, do this. And and I really wasn't, I couldn't move there. You know, I had a job and yeah, you know, was, I couldn't move there. So I was really just training there on the weekends. And so I would still train with those guys with Paul and um Fabian and them um during the week. Mm -hmm. So that meet that you're talking about, he was asked to give a seminar and in, in Louis fashion, he's not taking any money for it. So yeah. there's, there's no compensation. There's nothing <laughs> official, you know, about the whole thing. And I think it was uh, Dr. Larry, I can't, his last yeah, name is Miley, Miley yeah. Ray, right? That wanted him to come and do that. And so, and Louis didn't want to do it, yeah. you know, and did it because, because of him. And then that next, I believe that Monday, they showed up to drug test him, right? Because oh he's now associated yeah, with, with, you know, the USAP. It would have right. been the USAPL at the time. Right. And he, um, and, and, and Louis Fashion threw the guy off of his porch. Yeah. <laughs> and 
you know, came into the gym and he's telling us about this. And sometimes with him, you didn't know what to think. Yeah. Right. It's like, no, nah, there's no, no there's way no happened. way yeah. they actually showed up, yeah. you know, to drug test your ass. Then you find out later that they did. did. And you're like, this is so fucked up that yeah. he didn't even lift. It wasn't even official. He's going there for free, yeah. you know, on his own dime yeah. to help people to learn how to bench. And instead of just saying, thank you. Yeah. We're going to drug test you. And then probably ban him from the yes. SHL. Well, I guess they yeah. couldn't because yeah. they couldn't drug test him. Yeah. He threw the guy off his porch. <laughs> right, but right. Just to go through all that stuff is That's just wild. like- Not surprising. Like, this is un <laughs> unbelievable. You know, so it just, it drove that spike with Louie just a little bit deeper oh, yeah. against, you know, screw these guys. Right. Like this is- Bullshit. Right. Yeah, understandably. And yeah, yeah. And then there's the other side of it that let's say he would have when he would have, but say he does test positive, then anybody that would have, I don't know what the rules were at the time, anybody that would have been there at the time, no, because he would have had to have been tested positive first. Yeah. So it could have been their way to keep him from ever doing it again. Yeah. Because if he's banned, then he can never do something like that. It was yeah. just ridiculous, is, is what so... it was. Just freaking ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so you start making these weekend trips there. And then actually before I get into that, because I was listening to, uh, I don't know which podcast it was two days ago, where you were talking about, even through gymnastics and the other things that you were doing sport-wise, soccer, and you were looking for something, yeah, you know, that, and even the bodybuilding, something that you could be the best at. Right. When did you, with powerlifting, when did that hit you like, this is the thing? that I think I can really be the best yeah. at. It was definitely that day at the semifinals. It was like, this This is what I've been looking for, you know, just in life in general. I just was like, just kind of lost, you know, like like even in school, I was like, what am I going to do? I can't pick out anything that I want to do with my life. And not that like powerlifting is what I want to do with my life, but it was just like, this was the thing that I felt like I was missing and knew was there, you know? And I was like, this, this, and it's served me well, you know, in all, in all areas. Well, I think it's a, it's we're now we're talking about a different mentality though. Yeah. Right. You were looking for something that you could basically dominate. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I wanted to be the best in the world. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah, believed it. Yes. You know? Yes. So, <laughs> in when you were bodybuilding, did you see the potential there? But it was just it was too much, too long to be able to yeah. get there. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I loved the lifting aspect. I loved the training. Um, I loved. The day of competition, I think that probably had to do with gymnastics because I was so used to to having that spotlight on me and having to perform. So I enjoyed the day of. I did not enjoy the dieting, um, and I didn't really. I was kind of like, I don't like. I said at the time, if if physique was around at the time, I might have continued to to do it. Maybe both powerlifting and physique, but there was just bodybuilding, and I was like, I'm never going to be that big, and I don't really want to do what it takes to be that big. So. I just couldn't see that being the thing that I really wanted to to excel at. Can you kind of, where did that mindset begin that you wanted to do something? You could be, the, obviously it didn't start when you were four, right? right? Or maybe well, you were born with it. I don't know. Kind of. I mean, I mean, growing up, gymnastics was the thing that I stuck with the longest, but, you know, my mom would always say, like, if I pick something out, you know, I would do it for a couple of years and I'm done with it. And, you know, I, I just kind of consider that to be like, almost like, like controlled quitting. I, it wasn't that I was a quitter. I just was like, this isn't the thing, you know, well, and I'm searching. not gonna, yeah, I'm searching, you know, so I'm going to try something else, you know? And, um, in college I was like, I don't know what to do now because, you know, when you're growing up, there's so many sports to choose from, but then you get into college and it's like, what do I do? So I started running all the time and I was like, I, I enjoy this because I just enjoy working out. I love working out, but I was like, this isn't the thing. I am not built to to run long distance. You know, I did it just for the challenge of it. I like challenging myself, but I knew that wasn't the thing. So I still was like, man, but you know, when you're in your 20, you know, at the time in my twenties, I'm just like, what, what is there to do now as an adult? You know, I didn't know, I didn't know anything about powerlifting or that that was a thing. And at that time I really didn't even pick up a weight. So, you know, I didn't know what was coming next. I just thought, well, I guess now I just graduate and get married and pop out some kids and, you know, just be, you know, but at the same time, I was like, that's not my passion. That's not what I feel like I was meant to do, you know, more power to people that that is what that that's their passion and what they strive for. But for me, it was just like, that's not, that's not what I'm looking for. So then after the semis mentally, what shifted and what changed because you found it, yeah. right? So then. Did your lifestyle change? Did lifestyle factors change? Did everything 
become more focused oh, yeah. into that. For sure. Then I was like, okay, I'm not going back to bodybuilding. I'm just going to focus on this. And, you know, like I said, it was only a month or two after that, that I started traveling to West side on the weekends to train. And, um, and at that point I was then training for the Arnold, you know, cause there were, the WPO was still at the Arnold. That was in 2006 is what I was training for. So I just really dove deep into training and got all the, you know, got all the gear. I don't know why, but I was wearing a Rage X, but ended up switching to a denim denims were still pr kind of popular mm -hmm. it was kind of at the end of their era but i wore the denim and got used to that and i actually benched you know i went from benching i think i can't remember what i benched at the semis but it was like in the threes like maybe maybe mid threes um but by the time the arnold came around in march i was wearing the denim and benched uh 402 and just barely missed i took an attempt at the world record julie scanlon had the world record at the time so i um went for um, whatever it was somewhere around four thirty, and just barely missed that. And so I was like, oh, yeah, all right. Like I thought squat was my thing. I was like squat. I just felt like a invincible in the squat. I was like, I could just go up on this endlessly, not, not realizing at the time that seven Oh five was like, okay, to, I got to seven Oh five super fast, but to get from seven Oh five to anything beyond that, I was gonna have to fight for every five, 10 pounds. But, um, bench press was really hard for me. I got to that 400 and I started working with George Halbert on Sundays mm -hmm. and that was like all the difference in the world. He just really taught me how to, to be strong, you know, and to, and to, he, he had a huge influence on my bench, you know, even just the training aspect of it and different exercises and special exercises and got so much stronger benching with him. Um, but at the time, yeah, the 165 world record was 429. And so I was like, well, I'm close to that too. So then it was like, okay, the total world record, um, the deadlift, I just was like, it's funny. Cause when I was training for body, I loved deadlifting. I was felt like I was super strong at deadlifting. I did, I didn't ever really max out, but I did a lot of reps with deadlift. And I was like, this is, this is my favorite lift. This is what I love to, to do. And actually at one of those, um, non-sanctioned competitions. The last one that I did before I did like a, like a sanctioned meet, I think I pulled 435, like raw conventional. And as a bodybuilder, I was like, you know, this is, I love deadlift. The deadlift is my lift. And then it just became the lift that I hated the most, yeah. you know, um, you know, cause you mostly cause you just can't get as much out of the gear. Um, but yeah. With that change in your, your, I don't really say why is a change because it was always there with, with, um, let's just say winning mindset being, I don't want to say ignited because it was already ignited, but gasoline poured on it. Yeah. Right. So that's going to change the way that you see the training. Did it also change the way that you saw recovery, nutrition, hydration, and all those other things, or just the training? Uh, it, it did. Like I, luckily I kind of started in bodybuilding. So my, nutrition was good. Like I ate like a bodybuilder, I ate all the right things, ate all the protein, good carbs, vegetables. But then I, um, kind of adopted the powerlifting mindset of like, yeah. eat like crap too, you know, on top of that. So I was eating pizza on Friday nights cause I was squatting big on Saturdays. Um, you know, doing a lot of that. So I, you know, I, that's kind of one thing I was just like, I really probably didn't need to do that, especially as a lighter lifter. I didn't need that excess body weight cause it was really just making it harder to cut weight. Um, and made my gear tighter. And so, you know, I remember one time having to cut my squat suit off of me and it's just like, I probably didn't need to do all that. And as far as recovery goes, I really, you know, my whole life kind of revolved around powerlifting as far as like, I got to make sure that I rest. I don't do anything else. Like I, I don't want to like go. I remember one time someone was like, let's go kayaking or canoeing. I was like, no, I got a bench tomorrow. Like I'm not doing that. You know, <laughs> you know, I just really took it maybe too seriously. And I, I'd say this a lot in seminars. It's just like the importance of conditioning that I think we were lacking back then. It was just like, it was all just only lift. Don't do any conditioning because that's going to hurt your lifting. And it's like, man, you know, now, you know, we're starting to learn that like, actually, if you're in shape, you can actually lift better. Yeah. You can lift better. You can get through meets a lot easier. You know, there's a lot of benefit. It, it'll help you recover from the training, you know, not being so out of shape. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you get up to that 700, right? So all lifters are going to get to a certain point to where it's not easy, but it becomes hard. Oh, yeah. Right? That was like so, my wall right there it was 700 to 775 took the rest of my career. I got to 705, you know, within a few months. And then um, it took the rest of the 10 years to put on, you know, to put on or maintain, you know, because it was, it was kind of up and down, you know, how, how it goes with that. Um, it took the rest of the time, you know, 70, 70 more pounds 
you know, 10 years. <laughs> well, you were, <clears throat> you were, the, you were, you basically came in after I left. So mm -hmm. there's, <clears throat> but while I was there, there were, there were people that would come in kind of like what you were like, just on the weekends or yeah. just for a couple of the days. And then Paul Gildress would be one that I know is an example. And I kind of admired them for certain things. I mean, other people didn't like them for other reasons right. because they weren't there, yeah. but you know, but I admired them for the, because they could do things we really couldn't do without Louis, I know, yeah. Replication. I kind of right? felt bad. I was like, I feel like I'm getting away with something that other people are not, you know. So. No, but it, but it it, it 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 gives a little bit more freedom mm -hmm. to be able to tweak things, especially when you're at that point, right? Right? Because there's, you know, the whatever you want to say was his basic West Side model. Yep at that time and then there's the modifications that people were making to it that were there but then there are also modifications people were making to it that were there but not always there right right, right. things like you know free swatting every now wow. and again you know different type of things um i'm gonna guess that you kind of you rode the line for a while of just doing exactly what oh yeah you're supposed to do if mm -hmm. you're doing what he says right, you're supposed to right. do. And that <clears throat> kind of like runs you into a wall yeah. if you're at that point. Yeah. But then you got to start tweaking some things. Yeah. What were some of those things that you started tweaking around? And the, uh, it would be the free squatting. Like yeah. I started to realize I'm like, I love box squatting. I love it to this day. I love box squatting. But what got me to where I was, was uh, free squatting technique. Like I was a technician. And I really needed to, to do that more frequently. And, you know, Louie didn't like that. And I remember one time he came in and I was like full gear squatting. He was, I know he was mad, but also at the same time, he was like, she's putting up world records. You know, he just kind of, that's when I was like, all right, I'm like, am I getting away with something that other people are not? I kind of felt like I was, you know, so sometimes if I was going to take a free squat, I would do it up in Detroit with those mm -hmm. guys. And but I, you know, for the most part, always stuck to the West Side template of training. You know, it just, I just needed to get into my gear more frequently, especially on the squat, you know, cause that's what really helped me. Like it was, you know, practicing the perfect pickup. Cause if, if I had a terrible pickup, I wasn't going to squat the weight. I knew from the second I would pick it up if I was going to make the weight or not. And I couldn't do that with um, a safety squat bar and a bunch of bands in a box, you know? Mm -hmm. And I also started to notice that I was like, you know, the, the big guys at West side at the time, you know, some of them, they would make squats into me, but sometimes they wouldn't, they would bomb out. They were like the strongest people there by far, but they were missing their squats because you could just see them kind of searching for depth, searching for the box. And, you know, there, I just was like, okay, I think they could benefit from taking a squat every once in a while and getting in tight knee wraps. They hated knee wraps. You know, I just like, I need to, to wear all that sometimes just to get used to it. So that was the biggest change for me. Like the, the benching was fine. I was totally fine with only getting my bench shirt, like maybe once a month. And actually the further I got along, I really actually only wore my bench shirt in meat prep, you know, for some, some of the benches in meat prep, but during the off season, it was just all raw, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but the, the squatting, I kind of needed to practice my technique a lot more than what he would have liked. <laughs> if it <clears throat> I often wonder because Dave kind of did, you guys are kind of there at the same time. Yeah. So Dave was kind of doing the same thing right. in, in private right? you might, oh, yeah. because Louie <laughs> wouldn't go in there because it'd be too late. But, and Louie eventually, you know, changed his outlook mm -hmm. on yeah. how that went. But I wonder if you guys weren't doing that, right? Because yeah. it also helps you break an all-time world records, right? Right. right. And that formula wise, you're both, you guys are just destroying everything. Yeah. So Louie was stubborn in his ways, but not so much that he's not going to look and see. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. These two, yeah. you know, are doing this and then it starts to change, right. you know, with everybody else. If that wasn't the case, I wonder if it ever would have oh, changed. Oh, definitely. He, he would have probably been like, this is not working for you. And, you know, I've only ever had really great experiences with Louie. He's yeah. always been so, you know, good to me. And I, th but I still think that if I you know, if I would have stopped producing. And actually there was a whole year where I bombed out every meet. I, I think it was 2007. I bombed all the time and, um, he never gave up on me. I was like, literally I, I, 
I must have done like three meets that year or something. And on the third one, when I bombed out, I just I was like, I remember going, like when he was approaching me, I was like, I'm about to get kicked out for sure. There's no way. And um, I just remember him saying like, I, the, he bombed out some crazy amount of times in a row. And then when it just came back, you know, and that's exactly what happened to me. I don't know what was going on that year. I wasn't like doing anything different. Um, but I just had a rough year and then it all came back in 2008. And I, you know, I just think that's kind of what lifters today don't realize, you know, you know, they, they only see what, like the good lifts that I've done and the, the, my numbers that I ended up with, but I'm like, I had a lot of bad meets and lifters today just don't really have a lot of bad meets, you know, and if they do, it's just like, you know, the end of the world. Well, <laughs> like, I, you gotta yeah. have some bad meets. <laughs> well, it's, Dave said something on the first podcast I had him on, which is kind of stuck and resonated with me because it's everybody that I know it's been true with where they'll make really good progress for a couple of years. Then you go through this lull yeah. and it's not like you're doing anything yeah. different. Yeah. You're still training hard. You, you're doing everything right. You're yeah. trying to figure your way out of this hole, yeah. but it could be three bomb outs in a row. I had mm -hmm. a year and a half of the kind of the same type of yeah. thing. And Louis was never, never on me about it. It's like, I think he kind of knew that everybody goes through yeah. this, but then bam, you right. know, then it comes up where <clears throat> since Dave, I think was there for so long, he saw it happen to so many people that were older than him that he just realized, oh shit, I guess I'm just in that lull now. Yeah. I'll just ride this out, not get hurt. All right. And then when it starts coming back, I'll ride that as hard as I can yeah. until the next one. Yeah. And then eventually there's going to be one that you just don't come out of. Right. But I think to your point with lifters today, they'll start to hit that, get discouraged, frustrated, depressed, quit yeah. or whatever's going to, and not realize that their best meet may be. On the other side of that. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And they, they have to go through that because- mm -hmm. Usually something that's going to change is technical, Yeah, just something you didn't think. And we'll get into this as we talk about training. The littlest things at that point absolutely are freaking huge. Yeah, especially in multiply. I mean, it could be anything like, you know, even if your body weight changes a little bit, but you're trying to wear the same bench press shirt or squat suit, you know, everything it's, it's so, so technical and, um, and I think too, you know, some lifters now just have a shorter game plan. Like I never was like, oh, I'm going to lift for this many years and I would be done. Um, I had no clue how long I would lift, but now it seems like people are definitely like, I am going to lift for this many years and I'm going to move on to this, that, or the other. And so they're in a hurry. They're in a big hurry. So if they have three meets or a whole year, a year and a half where they're bombing out, they're just like, something is wrong. You know, something's wrong. I need to change this, change that. And they're, you know, rather than just like, just sticking with it and writing it out and knowing that it's going to come back. Like, you know, it's not like you've been doing it for 10 or 20 years and it's like, Oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm done. You know, mm -hmm. maybe this is, maybe this is it. And that's kind of where I was at the end. I never intended to retire, but I just had like a bad meet. And I just had that feeling. I was like, I feel like if I keep doing this, I'm going to be that person that's just like, slowly going down. I was like, I've had really good success, good memories. I feel like, I feel I've done everything that I can do. And I, you know, just was like, I'm just going to take a break and see if that feeling comes back. And that break just turned into a long time, but it also was, I, you know, started focusing more on, I had more training partners and I started focusing more on their success. And that's just kind of how I segued into, mm -hmm. into coaching. When your SWAT came out of that lull, what was a couple of things that you can point to that brought it out of that? Um, I just kind of went back to the basics. I, you know, gave myself a long off season and, you know, made sure, you know, I just focused more on getting strong, focus more on my accessory work, you know, because, you know, I had kind of like been that person that I always talk about a lot in seminars where I just was like focused so much on the main movement. And then I would just kind of do a couple leg curls, maybe some reverse hypers and I was done. And I just focused more, a little bit less on the, um, main movements and started focusing more on, on accessory movements and just building a, a base and building strength through accessory movements. Um, I started learning a lot more from Louie. I, you know, at that time he was kind of near that time is when he started doing the CrossFit seminars. And so, you know, I'd spend time helping him with that and hearing him talk about training and, you know, and then I started reading more and I was like, oh gosh, like I am overdoing, I, you know, cause sometimes if I would take a squat, I'd be in, I would take 12, 15 attempts, you know, and I'm just like not realizing that, you know, I was doing everything wrong, you know, so I just got smarter about training. 
was it listening to him the seminars that that brought that to the forefront yeah for sure it was like okay like seven to nine total attempts three attempts at or above 90 percent shut it down um you know my rest periods i stopped resting 20 minutes be between sets you know i kept mm -hmm. I kept it close to that way i had the um energy and the focus to be able to fo to to put into my accessory movements and you know kind of varying my accessory movements instead, instead of doing the same things and um dragging the sled more you know getting in better shape and through that then once i come out of that that lull where i had a lot of bomb outs that's when my deadlift was the best that's when i m moved up to 560 on the deadlift um tried the 585 so many times and for some reason couldn't get it and to this day i just i don't know what it is it probably should have been in in, in better shape i you know when i get to the end of the meet i was just tired i was out mm -hmm. of gas you know and it is hard because at that time then i was squatting you know mid sevens and you know and then i had to put on my bench shirt and bench in the fives and then still have the the capacity yeah. to try to pull almost 600 pounds you know it was just a lot to ask can you remember the first seminar that you helped him with mm -hmm. not attended but helped him yeah. with it and was the first crossfit powerlifting seminar that he did so i mean at, at that time i didn't know who anybody was but at the time i'm like dave castro was there katie henniger was there um graham holmberg like all the top people in crossfit at the time were there to to learn and they loved it i mean they loved it and he most of the the CrossFit courses all travel around. They travel around to different gyms, but Louis like, no, you, you'll come to me. So they yeah. were at at Westside every month or every other month. So we're going up to help him with that and just hearing him talk, you know, for two straight days about the Westside method. And I was just like, dang, like I've been here for a while, but now I'm understanding it a lot more, you know, and realizing what I was doing wrong because I wasn't at Westside full time, so he never got to see what I was doing all the time. So it really helped me with my training to set it up properly. Well, I think that when I would hear him speak, well, a couple of things on that. <laughs> when I would hear him speak, it was just, a, it was a mess. So there was that whole part, you know, of just it being a mess. Yeah. But if you know him and if you've been in Westside, even though it's a mess, you're able to comprehend what he's, yeah. what he's saying. So right. as he would be doing those, I'd be thinking to myself, we don't do that. You know, and yeah. then and then I would ask him about things, you know, as we would be driving uh -huh. back and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of the reason why it wasn't being implemented that way is because of the individuality yeah. of the people that were in there. And he yeah. knew some people would listen, some people wouldn't listen. Yeah. There's just, he, he's a puppet master too. Yeah. Right. So I had to, that was the hardest thing for me was to try to look at what the training principles are and see what it is, you know, and then see how he's got to be a puppet master that doesn't make that's where the whole if, if you're not in west side it's not west side yeah. thing kind of came from yeah. is because people would come in and be like you ain't doing any of that shit yeah. i'm like well we kind of are yeah but it's modified right you know for that yeah, depending on where you're at in prep or off season or you know i remember the first time i like because at that time they were posting a lot of videos a lot of training videos online and um well, this is actually a couple of years later. And w here we are teaching these seminars because at one point Louis stopped because they wanted him to travel around. And yeah. he was like, we did it a couple of times. We traveled with him and he hated it. Mm -hmm. So he's like, you guys go, you know, it was AJ, Shane and I like t going around to teach us seminars and, you know, we're teaching it by the book. 12 doubles, 12 doubles, 10 doubles, you know, everything by the book. And then, and then they're posting stuff of five by fives. And we're like, I don't know why they're doing that. Like, you know, and come to find out later, you know, it's just an evolution. And, mm -hmm. and you, he did it for a reason. It was because the groups were getting too big and, yeah. you know, they're and, lazy. Yeah. So it was just like, let's change it. It's still, it's still 20, 24, 25 yeah. reps um, in the right amount of volume. It's just breaking it into less sets, you know? So but I it makes still, it hard for you guys, right? Because you're teaching this stuff. And people and are like, seeing it and they're like, well, I saw this or I read this. Yeah. They're know, like, ah, wait this. a minute. Yeah. Like, oh, fuck. I, I don't know. know. You know, what does this mean? Yeah. Um, I got to ask this because I traveled with him a lot and he hated traveling. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was your experience flying with him? Uh, he, he hated it. I remember, I remember him going through um, security and they took out his toiletry bag and there was just something in there that was too big or, or something like that. And he was just like, throw it all away. You know, he was just like, it wasn't like, oh, sir, we'll just throw this one thing. He's like, 
nope, take it all. He was just yeah. so mad that they, you know, did that. And then I was a terrible traveler at that time. I've since completely changed into like a very easy traveler, but I was like, I'm checking a bag for a weekend trip. And so I hear I'm checking a bag and then it got lost. And he was so mad because, you know, here we're held up with that. We show up to the seminar and they had they had planned the host had said had planned the seminar for a Saturday, Sunday, and we show up on Friday because we were always taught the seminars on Friday, Saturday. So we show up a day early and that, oh my gosh, I mean, it just enraged him, you know? So it was, he did not love breaking his routine, you know, mm -hmm. and just, and not being able to be home and be at the gym and do all of his things, you know? So it was, it was rough. And he did it like two, I remember traveling at them two times. And then after that, he was like, I'm not doing this. You ever yeah. drive with him to one? No. Okay, no. the driving is <laughs> no. a different experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's an awesome experience because he'd yeah. get lost all the time. Right. And um, I like to see him get mad. I'm not yeah. going to lie. Right. So I, I he get mad. I try to make him even more mad because oh it just gosh. made me laugh so hard. <laughs> and because um, eventually he would start laughing yeah. because, you know, I, <laughs> he'd get lost somewhere. I can't, I can't believe you took that exit. So you shut the fuck up. You know, he's just going and going. And going. <laughs> I'm not the one that's driving. Your dumb ass is driving. It's just yeah. over and over and over again. And then, oh then it would turn into your a squat. You know, yeah. and just kind of like pivot the other way. Yeah. That was the secret that I had. Because if I didn't do that, I had to listen to this shit for another hour. And it didn't stop. Oh it went on God. for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, how can I take this to the peak and then get it to just come back down? Oh. And it was, it was. Interesting experiences. Some of them, some of them were fun though. But interesting experiences yeah, with that, definitely. and um, and then his classic after, <laughs> after no matter where he would speak or where this would happen, how stupid everybody was. Hmm? You know that was there, <laughs> like, and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, but. <laughs> We're, we're, we're here to help them not be stupid. <laughs> so that like you sh should expect them to not kind of right, know what you're nothing, doing. Yeah. <laughs> and then like dumb it way down, assuming that they don't know anything, yeah. but he'd be so mad that they didn't even know what a box squat was yeah, or something right. like that. I'm like, maybe we should tell them like what it is. Yeah. It took so long for him to really accept and understand like why CrossFitters would want to do what they're doing like why why wouldn't you want to just focus on being stronger why would you do all this other stuff that's gonna kill your strength you know and uh, over time he started to appreciate and respect it and see that like crossfit was kind of a form of conjugate they're just doing everything being good at everything you, know, you got to prepare for anything so it was actually the perfect training um system strength training system for crossfit you know mm -hmm. so he started to get it and understand it and um really enjoyed it i mean the whole time so when you pivoted, because at a certain point you guys were doing that CrossFit West Side thing, and it went through different iterations of people that were doing it, and then you started doing your your own. Yeah, I don't want to say your own version because it's still West Side conjugate, mm -hmm. but with your style of teaching it, right? Which is <clears throat> the people can communicate this in different ways, yeah. right? They're still communicating the same thing. But if you change the messenger, you can change how somebody's going to receive something. Right, right. Right. At what point did you start doing those that, I, I, that were your own, yeah. right? How long ago was that? That was 2017. Cause I remember uh, leading up to that when, when the CrossFit powerlifting cor course first started with Louie, there were only a handful of CrossFit, um, you know, subject matter expert seminars. And, you know, it was like powerlifting gymnastics. It was very, very basic. And so, I mean, we would have a seminar and there'd be 50 people like it, I mean, every single time. So it was packed out. And then over the years, like up until like 2017, I started to notice I'm like, it's like less and less and less people because there was a million options. You can scroll through yeah. the website and there's like 30, 40 different options for seminars. And these CrossFitters, they definitely invest in their education, but now there's all these options. So it really started to dwindle down a little bit to where, in my opinion, for me, it just wasn't worth traveling and spending because it was two full days of, of teaching, you know, so therefore, you know, I'm having to take off of work, you know, on a Friday or Monday or maybe both depending on where it was. And I just was like, Ooh, this is just not worth it. And so I kind of started teaching my own thing. I was like, what do I really like out of this whole experience? And it was teaching the technique. You know, I definitely want to go over the conjugate system because I think people need to understand it, but I don't think we need 
you know, that many hours of talking about it, you know, so it was just like, okay, I'm going to do five to six hours. We're going to talk for an hour, hour and a half about the conjugate system and how to implement it, different um, vari variations and stuff. And then we're going to go right into tech to hands-on work. Cause that's what people really enjoyed about those seminars. They couldn't wait to get out of their seat and do hands-on stuff. So I started then, and that was my specialty. That's what helped me be the strongest was, was technique. So I was like, that's what I want to teach people in, um, in not such a long um, course. Yeah. You know? Now, when so, you started to drill down on that, were you already retired from yeah, the sport? I had already, I, I essentially retired at the end of 2014. So this is, you know, basically two years later that I was like, I'm going to kind of see what it would be like to, to do my own thing, you know? And, um, and, you know, I talked to Louie about it, had his, had his blessing, you know, Shane continued to teach the CrossFit powerlifting course. Um, so that's kind of still going to this day. And, um, you know, just maintain my relationship with Lou and Doris and, you know, paying it forward to, you know, it was, it's just really important to me to keep the, the West side conjugate system going because it's what made me strong. It's what I enjoy teaching. It's what I believe in. And, you know, now that he's gone, I feel it even more. I was like, I, I really need to keep this alive. And I have such a passion obviously too, for multiply lifting. You know, I have a lot of raw, uh, lifters that I coach, but multiply lifting is really important to me because that's what I started. And I, I, I love it. I believe it's a skill. It's a different kind of sport within a sport. And so that's kind of been where I feel like my purpose is now is to, to keep that going, you know, and to keep, keep that information, um, pure, you know, cause it's, you know, everybody's this, that, and the other conjugate. And I'm just, you know, I see what they're doing. I'm like, that's not really the West side conjugate system. And so, you know, I am trying to maintain that for, for people. When you were first doing the seminars with, with him and with the CrossFit, mm -hmm. you were still competing at that time. Yeah, that was cause I was in 2009. Yeah. So I still was right in the thick of things. And, um, I think too, like if I, you know, I, my bench started, it kept going up. Like that was my bench was kind of my, my lift at that time, but my squat struggled a little bit, you know, it was here, it was hit or miss. I mean, 2011, you know, it was my best meet ever was in 2011, but the traveling kind of took a toll a little bit. Once we started to travel, I think was in 2012 or 13. So that makes sense. 2011 was a great year. Um, once I started to sit on an airplane, you know, maybe a couple times a month and stuff, things just started to hurt. I never knock on wood, it got out of, um, my career without any major injuries at all, very little pain. But once I started traveling a lot more, that's when it started, I it started to hit me and I was just tired. You know, it was just by the time 2014 came and I had that meet, I was just like, I am just tired. You know? Was it, was he telling you at the time that the seminars were going to screw up your lifting? Um, he, I don't know. He didn't like, I feel like maybe he thought I could handle it, you know? And, and for a long time I could, but, um, yeah. After a while, I just kind of got, I just, I just like, I think my time is here. Yeah. yeah. He was, he was definitely on me about that. Yeah. Because you know, the original, because my original one was the West Side Seminar, which I would, he helped do. Actually, he, he didn't want to do what he was doing. So he said, you just do it. Right. Then I started doing it. Then he started saying, this is going to fuck your training up. Yeah. I'm like, no, it's not. It's no not going to do that. And then, <laughs> then shortly thereafter, I'm like, man, this is kind of really fucking my training up. Mm -hmm. I got to figure out. Because I would squat in the morning and and leave the gym, you know, with horse liniment, chalk, and all, just with all the shit, and then go straight to the airport, do the right. seminar, yeah. and then try to get back. Sometimes speed bench there, but then get back for Monday. Yeah, and then they say this, this, this shit ain't working. Like yeah. I need to do the meet and then backload them all. Yeah, like do like four of all them after the meet. Yeah. Just, <laughs> then that was like this is terrible yeah and then then it, not that long thereafter i'm like i'm i'm done like I, i'm i'm he i don't want to say he was right because i don't want to give him the credit for being yeah. right <laughs> but he kind of was right but yeah. it it fell at the it fell at a time in my powerlifting career where it was basically over anyhow yeah you know hanging on too long yeah. which i try to not have people do now right which is a, you know, we'll talk about that yeah, as well because yeah. there's a lot of people that do that as well. And yeah. it's, it's different for different people. And, um, but it was the same type of thing with that, but it's, it, it was just like, it's like, like 
fuck, he's right. You know, like, I'm not going to tell him he's right. I'll wait, then I'll tell him later. <laughs> like, you remember when you told me? Yeah. Yeah, you were absolutely right. I told you, you know, how he is. Yeah. You know, with all that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it did, <clears throat> for me at least, and it sounds like the same was true for you, listen to, listening to him present from the from the first time and having a background and, and reading all the shit that he read and I, I, all, all all other shit too because i yeah. was uh he was consulting with strength coaches a lot then too mm -hmm. so there was a lot of that which he was a different person there yeah than he was with the seminars as well and i i'm an astoundment I'm like, I didn't know you knew all this shit. Like, and back then he wasn't talking about any kind of sport training or anything like that. It was just, you know, powerlifting, powerlifting, in powerlifting USA in the videos. It was just this boom, 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 right. boom. Then when you'd speak to the coaches, I'd be like, the yeah. this is what you need to talk about. Yeah. Right. And it's and then when AJ came in, I remember telling him, you need to get him to talk about other sports, yeah. you know, and how he would train them and what he talks to these coaches with. And nobody was able to actually get him to do that until Tom. So I yeah. give Tom all kinds of credit for that. And because people will look at, you know, Louie in, in his last decade, maybe, mm -hmm. and not understand that everything that he was saying about track and field or all these other things he's been saying for 30 years right right he just wasn't publicly saying it yeah but for us that were around it we're like this is really what people need to know yeah. from the masses you yeah. know from but he was just set on at that time just this this Making this. the strongest lifter so people just assume that the conjugate that the west side conjugate system was just for power lifters and yeah. that it was not a system for athletes that could be adapted to power lifting or track and field or football or anything like that yeah yeah and i think the whole crossfit thing kind of helped him to verbalize it better maybe right yeah definitely. you know to, to be able to see how it can be applied yeah outside of a three lift multiply lifter right but at that point, he was so stereotyped with so many people yeah. of, of just that. Yeah. And then he started getting more examples of people like John Kerr was a football player. And, um, he, you know, he had some throwers that would come in and, and train there for several months. And, you know, so he had more like hands on examples of people that like were do in there in the mix, even with the power lifters training and improving their sport, you know, mm -hmm. so he you had some people that were, you know, to start actually immersing themselves in, in, in West side, you know, that were not power lifters. And I don't know if that was a thing when you were there, but it seems like when I was there, it was always like different, different athletes that were there actually training and, and, and not just for a day, they were mm -hmm. like training for months at a time and getting incredible results. So, you know, I think he was able then to use that information to, you know, and people started to take notice. Yeah. We had maybe one or two on Denver, so that was it. Yeah. And, but when I would have lunch with him, you know, in the later years, you know, it's, he liked, I want to politically say this the best I can. He liked training those athletes more than he liked the lifters. Yeah. Towards the end. Yeah. Right. Because they had the mentality. Mm -hmm. If there's anything, yeah. he liked training a certain mentality right. of person. Right. Right. Be it power lifter or, or not. Mm -hmm. That I think is what he may not verbalize it, but that's what he loved more than anything. Yeah. He wanted people that would. Driven and want driven. to be the best. Yeah. Yes. Very driven. Yeah. Want to do the, run their heads through a wall. Right. You know, only people that he had to pull back, not push. Yeah. Forward. Yeah. He definitely didn't want to take his time to have to like motivate you and get you like out of a, you know, it's like, no, if you don't want this, like I do, then I don't yeah. want to work with you. Yeah. <laughs> when did you know that? the um, the drive that you had for competing was able to be satisfied with coaching uh in 2014 i remember i start my my own like training group started to grow so um you know i had started having more females that were like either moving to cincinnati or were cincinnati local that started to train with me and um i you know they were strong so i was just like after that meet in 2014, where I was just like, man, I need a break. Cause I just feel mentally exhausted. Um, I started noticing like they had meets coming up and I would 
take my time to like, I'm wrapping all their knees and, and doing all this stuff that was definitely taking away from my training, yeah. but I didn't mind. I was just like, I, you know, at the time I w- was training with Heidi Hauer and I was like, you know, she's super strong. She has so much potential. And, you know, that was kind of, she was coming up. I can't remember what year it was that she did the 11 time body weight total, but, you know, I did the 11 time body weight total in 2011 and I, I saw potential in her. I was like, I think she could beat me. I think she could break my, you know, whatever, if you want to call Mm -hmm. it a record, um, be the next person to do 11 time body weight total and, and total more than what mine was 11.1 or whatever. Um, and she did. And so that once I had that feeling of accomplishment, when she did that, I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, I feel more joy out of what she just did and more like for my, for her, for myself, than then I feel as far as like motivation to, to keep pushing up. I, I wasn't like, Oh, she just did. I, I'm so happy that I helped her do that. But now I want to go do 12 yeah. time body weight. I didn't feel that. I was like, no, I want to, now who, who else can I help to, to reach whatever goal, you know? So it was just like, and I was like, Oh, I think that's, that's like my sign there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I still, I, it doesn't mean that I stopped training. I was still training with them super hard. I, you know, was able to maintain a a big level of strength for, you know, several years after that, you know, and until I started doing too much like cardio and conditioning and CrossFit and stuff like that. And that's when I, my, like my strength as far as on a powerlifting level started to take a hit, but I was okay with that too. You know, I was like, I just want to be strong, but I want to do other things, you know, to that make me happy. And I, I, you know, I get a lot of joy out of like just challenging myself to different things. So then it was like, all right, if I'm not going to compete in powerlifting, what else can I do? Like I, ran a half marathon or, you know, do, you know, whatever, whatever it is, you know, I just want to be able to have the athleticism and the capability of doing that and not be so limited to one thing. So I still, I still train conjugate and, um, to this day, I still do dynamic lower, dynamic upper, max lower, max upper, still do all that stuff because I truly believe in the system. And I truly believe that it's built for longevity. I'm 43 years old, still haven't been injured. And, you know, I better find some wood, but, um, still haven't been injured and I feel good, you know, and I truly believe it's because I didn't, you know, I don't know. I just didn't go too hard. You know, I, I was able to do a system that was able to, to facilitate that. Do you think that you still training that way? Not now, but Mm. then helped with the credibility and the buy-in and the lifters that you were working with? Oh, for sure. Like I feel, I'm not a, um, as far as like from a coaching aspect or like a leadership aspect, I am not a loud person. Like, you know, I, I've heard a lot of, a lot of men, especially on, on this podcast that are little talk about like their time at West side or their time in training or whatever. And it's like, you know, loud intensity and stuff like that. that's not me. Like I'm, I want to lead by example. So I was like, if you're going to train in my group, I'm going to be the hardest worker in this group. I'm going to be, I'm going to, my rest periods are going to be the shortest. I'm going to put the most amount of weight on the bar for accessory work. And, um, if you, if you, feel compelled, then try to hang with me, you know? And so that was what was kind of hard about like kind of letting go of that a little bit and not training to that level and intensity was like, that was kind of lost too in the group. It was just like, there needs to be someone who is either yelling and screaming or leading by example by, you know, trying to do the most and, and, lead that way. So it was just, it was super hard. Cause I'm just not, I'm not a yell in your face kind of person. You know, I'm a lead by example and it's hard when I can't do that anymore. Yeah. You know, that's what sucks. Well, it's, the, um, not everybody in West side was that loud person. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there's, I can only speak in my time there. Right. So I can't really speak past that, but right. it's probably all the same, but you know, the, the movie's true to a degree, but then it's not, you know, to yeah. another degree yeah. because it's, it's not portraying all the people that weren't loud, right. You know, that had real jobs, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. that, you know, had all these other things and there were more of them than there were the other, Yeah, you know, so it's, I'm sure you have the same thing. It's, there's interesting perceptions of the movie from the people that I've trained with. And I'm sure that you've trained with because they see it. And some people are like, oh, fuck yeah, that's great. I'm like, it's not exactly how I saw the whole thing, you know, because 
I was there trained left train. Yeah, you know, I had clients, you know, so yeah. I wasn't there all the time with all the other stuff. And so were a lot of the other people that I trained with mm -hmm. at the time too. Now there, yes, there was some crazy shit. There's no doubt about all that, but there, I can use Rob Fuzzner as an example. I never got fired up for anything yeah <laughs> you know joe mccoy never for anything yeah. just lay down just, like are you even psyched up like what the fuck are like, you doesn't matter because she just kicked everybody's ass so yeah. i guess in his brain that's where he needs right. to be right you know then you start to learn don't let and don't let those people go there yeah you know because they're gonna it's not for it's, it's gonna be a mess if they go right. there they're gonna screw something up for sure yeah they're a fall over on their pick something's gonna mm -hmm. be messed up like yeah. this is right where they need to be which is interesting because the other people that probably be more my end that are go at and you know out of their mind you know don't understand it yeah like they're not trying yeah like, right, right. Uh, actually they're trying yes. more than you think yeah but they don't look like that other thing yeah and louie was kind of good at knowing you know where people had to be yeah. with that you know and to be able to run that way where it's it, it portrayed it kind of portrayed like this big thug culture yeah which it may that's that's why i was so intrigued you know <clears throat> when i reignited the podcast to bring people out that were there to see like did it turn into that yeah. because it kind of was a little bit but did it like turn all into that and i still don't quite know the full answer to that but i don't it definitely percent wise probably increased. Yeah. But not to that full. No, definitely. Cause I mean, a lot of podcasts that I've been on, that's one of the number one questions people will ask. Cause they they're like, what was it like? You know, cause they want these stories of like, you know, these like interactions and fights and stuff like that. I'm like, no, I really never saw any of that. It was actually, I mean, Tony Ramos would talk a lot of shit, but like nobody yeah. was fighting and you know, it was actually a, you know, a good experience. Everybody trained hard, but there was not, at, I was, it came in at a time where people, you know, were, like I said, like had real jobs, where had yeah. college degrees and, you know, maybe worked a nine to five, you know, so it was a much different experience, but still good. I mean, everybody was, the numbers were going up. Yeah. Well, it's the the one funny story I used because people used to always ask me about <laughs> when I was doing seminars, it was Chuck, 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 Chuck. Yeah. It was always about, Chuck. about him. Always want to know about him. And so it's, I'd say, well, he's always the first one there actually setting shit up if Louie didn't already have it all set up. Yeah. And then people don't want to know what really happened because they don't want to do it. Right. So yeah. somebody set it all up and then the training was basically over in an hour and a half. Yeah. And then Chuck was the one putting everything away. <laughs> Right. So, yeah. yeah, he's the guy that cleaned all that. He wasn't throwing plates around. Right, he was the one right. cleaning all the shit up, yeah. putting it all back or yelling at everybody else to put their fucking shit right. away, you know, all this other kind of stuff. But see, they don't want to hear that. Yeah. You know, he was in there early so he could do his 28 sets of lap pull downs. Totally, exactly. Yeah. You know, beforehand. <laughs> they don't want to hear that. Yeah. Right. They want to hear all these the other fun things. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. The fun stuff. Yeah. But that's even weird too because, and because they, they all went West Side stories. I mean, I got like five five of the five of the 20 questions that came through the just like west side story. and it's like yeah i don't think they understand how hard the turn the mics off we can have great west side yeah. story <laughs> but i'm not going to sit here and talk about people that i know right you right. know that they did stupid say, shit yeah. they can say it but that you, you'd be a shitty person to do that yeah right yeah. you just you really would be <laughs> right. and it's so i don't know why people would expect all these different things you know to be thrown out yeah. and but they never asked like what the good things were exactly. like what is some what were things. some really good things and there's a lot of good things mm -hmm. too of people helping other people out yeah. you know if they needed it and stuff like that so yeah. there's a whole that got left out too exactly but that doesn't sell tickets no i know i mean everybody wants to hear about louis getting mad kicking people out and it's like man like i just have just all my memories are of louis you know have filling his car up with stuff to take to homeless people or you know one of the trips that we took for the seminars there was a guy on the plane random guy comes up to louis and like louis didn't know who he was but he's telling him you know you don't know who i am but you know, I called you one day, you answered the phone. And I think the guy was in the military at the time and he had a horrible back injury. Louis sends him a reverse hyper, like mm -hmm. just sends him one, you know, and, you know, sends it, doesn't think about it, sees him on a plane. The guy's, you know, just like totally indebted to him. I mean, um, you know, I think one of the first, yeah, one of the first programs that, that I hosted, you know, he's in line coming up 
to um, get into the door. And I'm th- I'm saying, no, 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 like let him in. And he was just insisted. He's like, no, I pay to get in. Here he is. He's got two belts in his hand that he's, you know, donating to the meat. There were probably a total of at least a thousand dollars. He's got $6,000 cash. He's about to give me for the prize money. And he's insisting on paying $10 to get in, you know, Mm -hmm. it's stuff like that, that really, that I remember that has like changed my life. Like I'm, I will never forget when he he insisted on paying to get in. Cause I was like, man, like, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, you know, some people would be like, you know, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, I host a lot of meets and I see people that try to just like wave as they, as they go by. And, you know, cause they're like, you know, I know her, you know, like she'll, I I don't need to pay to get in. And it's like, this guy of all people shouldn't be paying to get in and he's insisting to pay to get in. So I've, you know, learned from that. I'm like, I, I don't care who I am, what I've done. You know, I, you know, it just doesn't matter. Like, he he was always that way so generous and that's that's what i remember you know there's i don't have stories of you know terrible things or fights or getting you know people getting kicked out you know those aren't the things that i remember there there is more than that than people know yeah um for a long time i was selling a lot of his things because he didn't want to deal with it because he had a mail order thing first out of his house which was on larkham yeah and he didn't like dealing with customers that were not happy let's just put it let's just put it just imagine that right (laughs) so he's like you guys just sell all this shit he was just going to do the reverse hyper and like videos or something like that and um the amount of faxes that i would get send this send this send this send this send this send this was a lot yeah a lot and it went (laughs) yeah i mean a couple times it was like do you understand how how much this is right right and it's it's men not just one I'm many reverse hypers and stuff yeah. like that we're going through wow um and it was it left a mark on me let's yeah. just put it that way yeah. a, a huge mark on that because of things like you're saying and those get lost in the conversations too because he threw the the whole time i was there louie never threw anybody out yeah he had other people do it yeah right so there was like yeah. a vote it was right? like it was, i was gonna say it's like a group yeah now that decision. changed that yeah. that did change i did yeah. find out that did change <laughs> you know and it could be because when he started recruiting is probably a it's probably the right word yeah you know when he started recruiting people mm-hmm. you know things dynamics change because I think uh, some loyalty was lost, some respect was lost, you know, because people already came in with elite totals. Right. And I actually had this conversation with him because I might've been the first to come from out of town that had an elite total. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe a fucking thing he said for the whole year Yeah, and almost got thrown out (laughs) and then did what he told me, you know, came to the morning crew and yeah. my lifts went up 250 pounds. So he was right. So then I went and I had to learn more about it. So I'm trying to explain to him, you know, here's what my knowledge was before I came in, which is probably greater than what a lot of these other people are. Cause I kind of, kind of understood what he was doing, yeah. but not really. Yeah. To me, dynamic work was plyometric work. Cause that's what I was doing before, like heavy bag throws mm-hmm. and depth jumps and stuff yeah. like that. It's like, why not Same just concept. do that? You know? Yeah. And, and I'm like, you're opening Pandora's box. Cause now you're going to bring these people. Cause he wanted the all time best. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and if they're going to come in with the attitude that I had, you know, and I really couldn't leave. Right. Cause there was nowhere else to go. Yeah. Right. So it's like, I guess I just, deal with it yeah you know and then comply then get stronger was and at first i don't think it was that big of a problem after i left i think it became a little bit more of a problem yeah you know where people were coming for other reasons than just to get strong yeah and i don't those are still gaps i'm i'm very interested in all this right really interested really intrigued (laughs) right because the training system evolved a lot too Mm -hmm. and 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 you know, it's, there's a lot of branches that come off his tree. I don't think he understands how many branches that come off of his tree, yeah. you know, but a lot of those have formed new trees and new branches and all right, this other kind right. of stuff. And which is incredible if you look at where, where the original source comes from. Yeah. You know, there's people out there now that despise him for whatever reason. Yeah. But yet most of what they do training wise it's conjugate. it's it's come <laughs> from know, him like, yeah <laughs> you know it's like very very interesting how yeah. this goes mm-hmm. um 
so I, where I want to go next is into kind of your training philosophy and methodology with the clients that you've mm -hmm. worked with and both online and in house, but I got to use the restroom first. So okay. I got to take a break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is Dave Tate from Elite FTS. Last year, we partnered with Ken Kanak and to co-host the Swiss Symposium. It's built on hypertrophy in sport medicine for strength athletes and practitioners to come together in one place, which will be the Columbus Hilton at Easton. You are going to learn how to level up your training based upon the success and failures of others. You have to stay on top of your game if you want to be able to make the success and move forward at the pace that you want. Just to name a few of the presenters that will be presenting. We're going to have Matt Winning, Brian Carroll, Eric Serrano, Jim Wendler. That's just a few. These experts will be presenting on low back injury and prevention, exercise selection, as well as a business steroid recovery and restoration panel. If you want to network with one of the experts that we have presenting, we're going to have people there to be able to help you do that. To register for the Swiss Symposium, go to the EliteFTS.com website, look for the banner on the home page, click that, and we'll see you there. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. One of the ways that you can support the podcast is by purchasing or picking up our limited edition apparel. The shirt that I have on right now is one of the only shirts that we brought back for a second time. Normally, we'll never do that, but the only reason we brought this one back for a second time is it sold out within six hours. So we brought this one back. We also got a second one that we just dropped. It's our, I guess, just Halloween edition shirt. Go to leadfts.com or go to the link in the description. This really does help us out because this directly supports the Table Talk podcast. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the show. All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Why do, how, do, how do your quads cramp doing seated leg curls? But it was a reminder to me that I need element before my heavy training sessions, not just on days when I'm sweating like crazy or it's super hot outside, but there's something with their ratio of sodium, magnesium, and potassium, their scientifically backed ratio, however they explain that, that makes a huge difference with my training. Every morning I mix it in my oatmeal with, you know, protein and the other crap I mix with it. So I get a half a pack there every morning easy and it actually makes the oatmeal taste better. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk. When you go through that link, you'll get a free sample pack of all the different flavors. So maybe you think you might not like the grapefruit. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe you think you're not going to like the chocolate. I thought it was going to be awful, but it was in the sample pack. And then somebody gave me the idea to throw it in oatmeal. And it was like a game changer to my oatmeal as far as how the oatmeal tastes. The sample pack will allow you to test flavors to see what you like and what you don't like. So head over to Element. All right, let's do it this way. Let's go from the easiest to the harder to explain, yeah. right? So <laughs> you have you have different options 
on how people can work with you. So I'll just kind of go that way. Right. So let's just go with the basic subscription option, which yeah. I believe is a trained heroic, right. which is just the basic program, yeah. right? That's so that's, we're not going to get any more basic than what that yeah, is. Yeah, there's no like coaching option. It's, you know, they're just following an app basically. Okay. So how is that structured and how did you go about structuring that? Because I'm sure that's not what I did at Westside or what you did at Westside. It's, I, it's pretty similar. So rewind back to 2013 at one of the seminars, the CrossFit seminars that we were teaching, um, the, the owner of CrossFit Maximus, at, he had started this app with another guy called Wadfollow and it was new. And he was like, really trying to talk me into putting like our gym programming, like onto that for like individuals, you know, here we are teaching the CrossFit powerlifting course, you know, why not give that option to CrossFitters online? And, you know, this is when like, it was kind of new, like mm -hmm. the whole online programming thing. And I was so reluctant. I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I want to do that. And you talked me into it. We were, you know, one of the first programmers on there and my gosh, it was like incredible. So many subscribers because there again, wasn't many options, you know, mm -hmm. this was so new. And, um, over the years people got more options and, you know, it became less, but still I was like, all right, this is, this is another aspect of what I do is putting programming online. And I did, um, CrossFit powerlifting, like, like programming, like strength training. And I would do powerlifting programming on there. And it was essentially what we were doing at the gym. I was just putting online and it still is that kind of that same way to this day. So I have several options. It's like CrossFit powerlifting, CrossFit, um, or no, um, just regular mm -hmm. conjugate powerlifting. Then there's conjugate CrossFit and then there's, you know, modified versions. Cause what I found that was that people wanted to follow a, like a conjugate type of system, but they don't have safety squat bars. They don't have, they, yeah. you know, they might, they might go to like a globo gym and just have a straight bar and basis, basic equipment. So I have modified options for both of those. So there's several things I have to input on a daily basis, but, um, gives people a lot of options. And, um, I like trying her because there's, you know, video, um, examples that you can put on there. So it's like, you know, if, if it's an odd, something that's not a standard like lap pull down or something like that, I can put a video on there. So even though it's just, you know, there's no human interaction with the person, they still, you know, are able to get a good um, training from that. But at the same time, what if they're going to do a meat prep or something like that, where they need to peak. So it's like, that's when they'll kind of move over into maybe more individualized programming. But I try to like, you know, basically there's like a, for me, there's like the, the base program, you know, that's what we're following at the gym. You know, mm -hmm. I, um, what my athletes that I work, you know, the, the power lifters in person, that's what we're doing, but I'm putting it online. And then if it's, then it just gets modified, depend on, depending on the person, the equipment they have access to where they're at in, in prep, you know, what their strengths or weaknesses are, then it starts to, um, get more individualized for the person. But I feel like, you know, just in general, we're all doing the same thing, you know? So the team QBP, we're all doing the same thing. It's just getting like modified per person basically. Um, because really in my opinion, like with the conjugate system, it's a system for everyone. So why do I, you know, this person over here, unless they have really specific, um, issues or needs, like why can't we all do the same thing and then just like kind of modify it or, you know, that's when you auto regulation comes yeah. in and stuff like that, you know, so then, then therefore it might get changed, but the basic, you know, the, the whole basis of the program is the same for everyone because it's really hard to, I think what's lost nowadays is there's so many options for gyms. There's so many options for coaches. There's so many options for everything. So you're kind of losing that group aspect of, of, of training. So even though if I have, I have a bunch of people remotely, it's still like, we're all a team still. So with what's the basic template look like? Is there, you know, four training days per mm -hmm. week? Yeah, two special exercise days, but four main training days, Monday's max effort lower. And if someone's in the off season, we're just rotating between a good morning, a squat and a deadlift, you know, rotating very classic, you know, conjugate, West Side conjugate, accessory movements, ab work, finisher. And then Tuesday would be a special exercise lower day. So for some of my people, it's just sled dragging. Some people that need to, you know, put on muscle mass, it's um, maybe some like four different exercises that are just light, high rep blood flow type exercises. Um, just, you know, essentially all it is, is to help you recover from, yeah. from the training session on Monday. And then Wednesday would do max effort. 
upper. So we're doing any variation of an upper body exercise, you know, in chains, bands, different specialty bars, working up to a one rep max. Um, and then uh, triceps, upper back, rear delts, abs, finisher, you know, it's it, the, the upper body days, there's a big emphasis on upper back and tricep work, you know, because with powerlifting and, and the way I usually teach the setup for bench press, it's a lot of upper back and triceps. Yeah. So that's the kind of the emphasis on those upper body days. And then Thursday, of course, is a special exercise upper day. Again, it's just high repetition. So we kind of put in the bamboo bar and different banded exercises, you know, just very high rep um, blood flow kind of stuff. Friday, dynamic effort lower still stick very much to the West side template. You know, it, I, I kind of rotate between, it's a three week wave, you know, very classic 50, 55, 60%. But, um, I've kind of changed like rep scheme. So it could be 12 doubles, 12 doubles and 10 doubles. And then I'll go into the next wave being maybe eight by three, eight by three, six by three. Then the next wave might be five by five, five by five, four by five. I've even, I've even done six by four, six by four and five by four. It's still the same amount of volume. We're just changing the rep scenes because, um, I, you know, as far as the people that I coach in person, I really, really try to reiterate small groups, you mm -hmm. know, short rest periods, building that GPP through, through your shorter rest periods. And, you know, I have some clients that I personal train, you know, that, that follow the same template, but I'll, I'll, I'm actually personal training them. And I'm like, I've got the actual timer on there. So they're really truly going every minute on the minute or every 45 seconds, depending if it's like doubles, we're going to every 45 seconds. So, um, that kind of woke me up when I did the NFL combine video with Louis. God, I think it was like 2008 or 2009. It was like me and Phil Harrington and he had us do, I thought, you know, I thought I was, I was like, oh yeah, I don't rest very long on dynamic effort day. Like, so this will be fine. And it was every 20 seconds. You had to pick up the bar every 20 seconds, you know, 10 doubles, right. And the devil platform was already set up for 10 doubles. And like, so we were done with everything in like 14 minutes. And I was like one of the hardest things I've ever done. I was like, I feel like I just literally did the hardest CrossFit workout of my mm -hmm. life or something, you know? So then I was like, oh, okay, I see. Now I'm not, you know, I, I think I'm in shape, but I'm not. And I, I think I'm not resting very long, but I really am, you know, cause at the time, like my training group for dynamic effort lower might've been five or six people. So really I, you know, I'm maybe doing a set every six minutes, mm -hmm. you know, so really try to reiterate keeping the groups to two to three people and, you know, just helping each other out, pulling the hooks, um, adjusting the height on the mono lift and stuff like that. So, you know, we're still, we're doing the dynamic effort lower followed by speed pulls. And I usually wave the speed pulls just like I do with the same, you know, in conjunction with the squats. So three week waves, you know, building up 5% at a time and with accommodating a resistance and getting in at least 20 reps typically. So it could be 10 doubles, um, might be eight by three, you know, but I'll keep the percentage a little bit lower on the, on the bar weight, just focusing on speed work and technique. Um, a couple accessory work exercises, abs and, um, finisher. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I, I emphasize the ab work because I think that's the, the number one thing people skip and you know, what I talk about in seminars, or if I have somebody comes to me and says, you know, I'm my deadlift has stalled. My, my squat has stalled. You know, there might be a million different things, reasons why it could be technical, but a lot of times you say like, you know, how's your ab work, you know, how, how often yeah. you do it? and it's usually, they're just like, you know, they'll, they'll self-admittedly say like, I, that's, I skip it a lot. I don't do much or I'll do the same thing. I'll do like a couple sets of like rope crunches or something and then, and then out, you know, but I try to organize ab work throughout the week. Same thing. One day for heavy low rep abs, um, ab work one day for static ab work, a lot of planks, heavy planks one day for obliques. And then one day for just like repetition ab work. And that's where you can throw in like your banded crunches or something like that. Yeah. Um, but just making sure that everything gets hit so that otherwise, if you just leave it up to the person, they're just going to either not do it at all, or they're going to pick the same thing. You and know. then the speed bench day would be the fourth. Yeah. The fourth day, you know, Saturday or Sunday would be speed bench and it would be, you know, very fast. It's, you know, 40 for like, everybody's a little bit different. If I can work with somebody in person, I can, you know, that's when you can really see what kind of weight they should be working with on speed bench, because you could say 50%, but some, some people might move 50% really slow, you know? So I remember when I was training for me, like 135 was like my sweet spot all the time. And for a long time, like I 
you know, I was training, I was training at Westside on the weekends, but I was doing dynamic effort in Toledo. And if I wasn't driving up to Michigan to train with those guys, I was just training at a, just kind of a local gym. They did not have any chains and I brought my own bands. So for a long time, I was just benching 135 against bands, nine, nine triples, three sets close, three sets middle, three sets wide done. And I was doing every week. I wasn't varying it. I wasn't like doing anything different. Mm -hmm. I was just doing that, but my bench was going up because I focused, you know, I, I could get through that in less than 10 minutes. And it gave me a lot more time to focus on the special exercises, the accessory movements that were actually going to build my bench. On the, are there special days after the speed days or only after the max just effort days? Just after the max effort days. So Sunday would be, if you did your speed work on Saturday, then Sunday's just full rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I still, I mean, that's what I was doing and that's still what I have people do. So, I mean, some, you know, little things have evolved since then, but a lot of it is the same. Like I am very, very much a purist of the West Side conjugate system and it's, worked. I mean, it worked for me, but it's also worked, you know, I coach Leah Reichman. She just got the biggest total of all time. Um, you know, beat Becca Swanson's total, you know, like I said, Heidi Hauer, she got, she did 11 point. I can't remember what it, what it was when she broke my total, but 11 point something, um, body weight total, Cosette Neely coach her. She's tiny 95. You know, she kind of goes between the, um, the 97 weight class to the 114 weight class, but she's totaled well into the 11 time body weight total now. Um, and all following the same structure of, um, of training. <laughs> so I, I just find that like the, 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 with the West side conjugate system as it is for some reason, for me, at least, I don't know if it's just cause me, I'm a female, but like it, it's working so well for the female athletes that I train. I do have guys at the gym and I, st I do have um, males that I coach remotely, but I find it to be a lot harder for me, like to understand. Cause I'm just like, for women, I just think we can handle a lot more. And you see that I saw that a lot with CrossFit, you know, when, when we were teaching the CrossFit powerlifting course, but also, um, having a CrossFit gym and seeing it firsthand, it was just like women just can do handle a lot more volume. They can handle a lot more accessory movements, a lot more repetitions. Um, and guys just respond better to lower repetitions. So I, I still, you know, I have plenty of guys that do really well, but I still to this day struggle with like figuring out that and they're very like person by person. I think the girls can kind of like all work together and all thrive, but the guys are, you know, this guy can do this much. This guy needs a lot more recovery. You know, it's, it's, it's so hard for me to, to kind of get a grasp on that. With the, the training day on the, on that basic template. So mm -hmm. we'll stay just with the basic template yeah. for now. <clears throat> the, the way that I would always break it down is you have that main movement, which is the speed of the max effort. Yeah. And then after that, I would call it a supplemental, which is trained a little heavier. And then after that accessory. So I, I do in my mind, I'll define a supplemental different than the accessory because a supplement may be a heavy three or five after that main yeah, movement. Yeah. And then the accessories are, kind of like hypertrophy, still mm -hmm. trained hard, but trained yeah. at a different rep range with your basic template. Is it broken down like that? Or is it just the main thing? Then accessories? It might be like if, if it's a good morning and it's a three rep max, um, I'll typically program down sets like, you know, like, like yeah. working down, um, a little bit uh, on the good morning, the same variation, mm -hmm. and then going into the accessory movements. Um, same thing, but typically it's more so with the raw lifters that I'll have them do that same variation, but like down sets, maybe like three sets of three at 80%, you know, something like that. Um, but, or I'll do the first accessory movement, even though it's not like a, a bench press or squat or deadlift, it's still something heavy. I try to start with something that's like in the six to eight rep range, that's heavy. Mm -hmm. And then it, you know, it just increases in reps as, as we go on. You yeah. know? So that first thing is going to be something if, if I were like working with someone totally individually or if someone was saying like, how should I program for myself? It's like, well, that first movement that is heavy, the low rep range, make that be something that is your weakness. If you've identified what your weakness is. If it's spinal erectors or hamstrings or something, that's what you should kind of attack first and then go from there. You shouldn't have your whole, you know, workout or all your accessory exercises be just the weakness, you know, because yeah. otherwise then everything else is getting weaker, you know? So we try, I keep it completely well-rounded, but we might just organize it differently for each person. All right. So with that, staying with that basic thing, because I, I want to, because the weak points kind of go into when it becomes right. more individualized, right? Because right? the basic thing, it's a subscription. It's just yeah. kind of rule through that, which most people are going to do very well with. Mm -hmm. But there there are some things that you kind of flew over really fast that I think are important yeah. if we're speaking West Side Conjugate. And I do like how you define West Side Conjugate separately yeah. because there's 
so many, so many different like, conjugate things right, that right. when I speak to people, it's I have a hard time. Like, what what exactly do you mean? Yeah. And then when they explain it, it's like, and that's not. No, I, I've listened to like a lot of people that are like, you know, self-proclaimed conjugate experts. I'll listen to like podcasts and I'm like, whoa, I'm so confused. And like, I, you know, so I, that's why I said, I'm just very passionate about making sure that this, you know, s- this information stays out there. Yeah. You know, well, the, what I want to circle back to are the rest periods yeah. for the squat and for the bench, because that's critical on how I would define this West side type template. Right. The, right. For instance, the reason why it went five by fives is because the, pre, the according to Louie telling me, <laughs> right. The, they were, <laughs> they were taking five minutes between sets. Yeah. Where had they actually taken, you know, 45 to 60 seconds between sets, that never would have changed. No, definitely. You know, so the rest periods are kind of vital, you know, with with that. So with the with the squat, you're looking at, what, is it 45 seconds to a yeah, minute? Yeah, 45 seconds to a minute um, on, on dynamic effort yes. work. But yes. if it's max effort, you know, I try to tell people, because I think the biggest mistake people make with max effort whether it's upper or lower is that they just put way too much. They do too many sets, too much volume, too much heavy volume that, you know, they just want to do more and more and more, which is great, but you got to go in with a plan. You have to know what your goal is for that day. And that, that does help if you've been doing this for a while. And you know, like if I'm doing whatever variation, I have a record of what my PR is with that. And that way it, it kind of controls making sure you don't miss weights, you know, that way you say like if I if my previous PR on whatever variation this is is 200 and my goal for today is you know I've been training for a while my beginner gains are over you know I'm going for 205 today you know maybe it's with chains or something but the bar weight is you know I'm going for 205 that's your 100 percent you know you do like maybe five sets working up all you know every attempt should be equal or lesser you know you shouldn't go like up and down you know right, it should yeah. be equal or lesser but those last three attempts let's say because it should be seven to nine total sets so three attempts at or above 90 percent just some control to make sure that you're not doing too much volume and not doing not enough volume you know so if you go in with a plan then you know that like okay like i got enough in this main movement i've got plenty of um focus and intensity and energy left for the for everything else for the day so i think that's the biggest thing people mistake is they have no plan at all so i mean i've seen people go in and do four sets because they just took too big a jumps and then they missed a weight and that's it you know yeah. what are you gonna do go back down and work back up again you know so it's like going in with a plan is is hugely important um and then also on dynamic effort especially lower day is not going too heavy. So I, that's why I'm such a stickler about the box squat. So, you know, obviously with the West side conjugate system, we're going to be primarily box squatting on, on dynamic effort lower for the squat portion of the workout. And so people will base their percentages off of their free squat. I mean, I don't know about you, but like my box squat was way different than if I was just doing a straight up box squat was very different than my free squat. That's not to say though, I've seen some of the guys at West side move enormous weights fast enough um, on dynamic effort lower on their box squats, you know, so, so people will see that and they'll think, oh my gosh, like I have to base it off of my one rep max box squat, but it's like, no, no, I've seen you do that. And it's way too slow, you know? So if you had like a, a bar measuring, a bar speed measuring device, it'd be 0.8 meters per second, mm-hmm. but you could, should be able to visually see it is too slow and therefore it's counterproductive because your, I mean, your central nervous system doesn't know that like on Monday that was, you know, heavy. Now Wednesday you did max effort upper, that was heavy. And now Friday it's heavy, you know, where it should be fast, you yeah. know, it should be fast enough that it's not going to, you know, put any wear and tear on your body or your, your central nervous system. It's, it's meant to be fast. So I think that's another mistake people make is in, in the volume aspect of, of the West side conjugate system is that they go too heavy on dynamic effort lower. So doing the proper percentages. Um, and for most people basing their percentages, like the 50% bar weight plus 25% accommodating resistance, that being based off of your one rep max box squat. You know, so that's why you should, you know, on your max effort lower days, every once in a while, maybe every 12 to 16 weeks, do just a straight up one rep max parallel box squat. Um, and if you're an equipped lifter, just, just briefs, um, and with a specialty bar, safety squat bar, giant camber bar, something like that to, 
determine new numbers because that you know that can change over time you yeah. can get better at that or worse you know but um, the bar weight should be fast so even if you've done that and you're like i've got the right percentages on the bar but it's you know moving slow don't be a hero don't i mean just lower the bar weight get good at moving weights fast you know before you add weight yeah i like to put out there if it's if it's the squat and even the bench and it's speed work uh, the squat I'm, I'm kind of the same as you are. The squat waves, the, the bench sometimes can just be a smooth yeah, wave. Right. It doesn't really need to. Right. But I mean, you should feel the last three sets. They shouldn't be hard. Yeah. But you should have to really focus right. to be able to, to finish. Them. They, they're doable. Yeah. But you need to think, okay, I need to like make sure my form is really good now. Yeah, definitely. And if it is good, it's going to be easy. Yeah. But if it's a little off... It's going to be a little harder. Oh, yeah. You, you have to maintain your focus like very intensely. Yeah. yeah. Now, the first couple, not so much, right? right. But that's that's a way to gauge, mm -hmm. you know, with that too. Because I see people, the percentages are either way, way too light. Yeah. You know, or the opposite, super, exactly. super heavy, heavy, which is ends up being max effort, mm -hmm. which, you know. <laughs> but that whole circumax thing kind of made max effort go on dynamic Friday, every so, day yeah, yeah. So, which is why the max effort kind of went away during that time period which doesn't get stated a lot yeah with the with the box the what i've seen with that is you know people will box squat separately than how they free squat mm -hmm. especially with raw lifters so i'll not use it a lot or I make sure that the way they squat on the box is the same way that they actually free squat, Yeah, which is different because then the box squat isn't really working the posterior chinks. You're yeah. not really getting back into that, right. but you still get that static to dynamic with that form where I've seen people screw up is, and it's, it's like common sense, right? Like they're, they're super wide. They sit way back on a box. They train for 12 weeks like that. Then they go to a meet raw and go to their normal stance, yeah. which they haven't done yeah. in ever. Mm -hmm. And then, can't figure out why it's so much worse yeah. than what it is otherwise. That's kind of like how over the years since Raw has become so much more popular, I've had to like figure out and experiment with ways with with uh, raw lifters that want to do conjugate. And I have a girl at the gym, Alex Donald, who she's a good raw lifter who has put her whole trust in me for training and doing the conjugate system. But I was like, I, I know, though, that I can't literally have her do it exactly how how it's how, how it's meant to be. She needs to she's a narrow stance squatter. She's a really good deadlifter. So doing the box squats, the wide stance box squats is really good for she's a sumo deadlifter. And if I can talk like when I'm teaching seminars, it's like if I can convince raw lifters of wide stance box squatting, it's because it'll translate into your deadlift really well. Like mm -hmm. you're going to build your hips, you're going to build your lockout. So how do we still wide stance box squat, like you said, without it ruining their actual squat form? And that's just a squat, their form more often. So sometimes on dynamic effort lower might be a three week wave of, of box squatting. And then the next three week wave is not is regular stance. Um, their regular squat stands, but it might still be with a, a safety squat bar or a giant camber bar with chains or bands or something like that. But, you know, cause I was just like, all right, they're super strong, you know, if they're following it, just like the equipped lifters are, uh, but they've just kind of, they're kind of out of practice. Mm -hmm. So how can we work in the free squatting more so that we're still getting the, the benefits of the box squat, building their hips, but not to where it's like, they're completely forgetting how to squat. All right. So now when we move out of the subscription thing, which is like the easiest basic template, yeah. which is, I asked you that just to see what your basic template is. Yeah. Yeah. Then you move into an individualized where you're overseeing it. So now you're going to bring in looking at the weak points and stuff like that. How do you determine what somebody's weak points are? Um, you just kind of see where they are failing at, you know, obviously they're probably posting their videos or yeah. sending you their videos and you kind of see where, where they're failing at or, um, you know, just visually kind of see where they're weak at and focusing on that. Like let's, let's rearrange the accessory movements. Um, so that a good morning, like, you know, I like to have good mornings in there in the off season, like every, few, every few weeks, but I also incorporate them as an accessory movement as well. So if someone's got like weak abs and a weak low back, it's like, we're going to do a little bit more of the good mornings in the accessory movements. Um, you know, so just kind of identifying that through video, it's, it's hard. Like, I mean, 
I, I obviously if someone's with me in person, it's just going to be a lot sure. different. It's just to be a lot different. So it's hard through videos, but, um, and then, you know, when someone goes to a meet, it's like, if they didn't have a great meet, they may have a great meet, but if they didn't have a great meet and they failed somehow, it's like, all right, now we know what to do. Like I had one girl that just had a, a rough meet recently. And it's like, all right, this next time around on max effort, lower day, we're going to good morning every three weeks or once a month. Um, we're going to do a, a max effort squat version, and then we're going to do some volume on the third week, you know, so it's gonna be a lot of squatting. And then a lot of her deadlift stuff, she needs just more repetition work. So you know, it's, it's going to rotate between speed, speed deadlift and volume deadlift. You know? so, what, so what did you see that made you come to the conclusion that's what she needed to do? Um, she, well, first of all, she just need, I know she needs more max effort squat variations. Cause that's, she just isn't used to grinding through a squat. Like okay. it was just clear that she just needs to have that feeling, you know what I mean? Cause I had her, had her doing a lot of like a little bit more squat volume cause she needed to put on muscle mass. And so it was like, but then wait a minute, well, then we forgot how to max effort squat. So how can we kind of keep that muscle mass going? Um, but also have that stimulus of the max effort. So we're just going to kind of rotate between that. And then that leaves that kind of kicks out the deadlift a little bit on, on max effort day. But I think in the deadlift deadlifts kind of respond a little bit more just to accessory work, like the type of accessory work you're doing and then volume, like repetition deadlifts, you know, I don't think deadlifts, I think deadlifts kind of move a little bit better with reps, you know, as far as like your one rep max moves a little bit better with repetitions than just like testing out your max more frequently, mm -hmm. you know, so selecting exercises, like, like for me personally, like I think that um, obviously good mornings, I think help with the deadlift, but seated good mornings particularly help with the dead, deadlift tremendously, um, box squatting, you know, so if someone's like got weak hips, we're going to box squat a lot more and we're going to do the wide stands box squatting. Um, so it, it's a hard thing with, with the conjugate system for raw lifters, trying to get, get all of that in there without missing anything. It's, it's a, it's a tough thing, but I've, I've actually enjoyed that aspect of it a lot. No, I've, obviously still very passionate about multiply yeah. lifting, but you know, the one, the raw lifters that I do have, I enjoy because they are a little bit more open-minded, you know, they're, you know, I, I get it. It would be tough. Like the raw culture is very kind of anti-conjugate, you know? So the ones that I do get that put their trust in me, I, like I appreciate a lot because I know that it's hard because you've got all this other, all these other, you know, seeing stuff online and all these other training programs that are just a lot of volume, volume, volume. Um, but the ones, the, the lifters that I do have kind of realize they're like, I would, I want to kind of do this for a long time. I don't really, I want a program that's going to help me do this for a long time. I don't want to like get super strong really fast and then get some sort of, in, you know, career ending injury. Well, the, the interesting thing to me is a lot of the, the anti-conjugate still have a heavy squat day and a light squat day in yeah. one week. Yeah. Right? right so right. what's the purpose of the lighter day is so the bar moves a little faster. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and, and see, recovery. They, they kind of test their max a lot. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm just like, wow, like, I don't know mentally how I could have done that. Like, I mean, I, granted, I was doing that a lot in the beginning, but that was just beginner gains. But once you kind of hit a plateau and you're working towards every pound that you can, I can't imagine just like testing that would just meant if I had a bad day, like that would be really mentally defeating. I think the hardest thing with them is trying to uh, trying to get them to understand that the the accessories will actually make the main yeah, lift go up. Right, right. Cuz that that there's like a big giant wall. Definitely. There's a lot of there's two trains of thoughts and everybody's kind of butting heads about that. Um, yeah. you know, this is like you need to squat or you need to do the main lifts more and over here we're like no, we need to do more um accessory movements to make to make you stronger and I think by doing 80% of your training being accessory movements, that's how you're building longevity. The gear brings in another another level with the training though as well, right? Because you still have to be able to hit that basic template, cover all the basic yeah. stuff, but then get in the gear. You know, and and like and what's recover. too much, what's not enough, you know? Yeah. That's, that's another aspect that's really hard and much easier to, um, to coach that if it's in person. Like, you know, if someone, if I'm writing a program for someone online, they're going to do everything as it's written. Whereas in person, it's like, I can kind of see the person and if they're going through a lot, you know, if they haven't been sleeping, they got a new job, like, you know, I, I can kind of like on the fly make adjustments that I can't see with someone that's halfway across the country, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's what's kind of hard. But, um, I typically, 
you know, even for people that are newer to gear, like I don't get in the bench shirt all the time. You know, it's, you know, I don't have them. I, it's still every third week or every fourth week in, in that. And then everything else is raw, you know, and on deadlifts, it's, you know, say same thing where squat and deadlift, depending if it's like off season, if it's off season, we're just doing a lot of raw stuff, you know, some, you know, people are like, I think people assume that multiply or equipped lifting is like, you're just in your gear all the time, which is not really the case until it's like you're in meat prep. Mm -hmm. It is like, we're getting in full gear a lot more often. So, I mean, even in the off season too, and this is the hardest thing for me to kind of get people like my athletes to understand is like, you're in the off season. There's a lot of circumstances that are different. So you're just training, you're training, you know, obviously you're working to get stronger, but there might be some circumstances that are going to make it so that you're not going to be quite as strong and, you know, and just getting them to accept that and know that once we get closer to me prep and we're in me prep, things, you know, are on the back on the upswing, you know, so the, I think the emotions and like the mental aspect nowadays is the hardest thing for me to manage with people. It's the hardest thing. Like, I don't know, I don't know if it is any different. I don't, I have no clue or if it was like this when we were, when we were competing, but if I had a bad day or if I had a bad meet, it was like, yeah, that sucked, but I moved on it from it like right away. It's like five minutes over it, done. Let's move on to the next thing. And it's a lot harder, it seems like nowadays for people to to move past that. Are they a bad workout. Are they competing more frequently or less frequently? I, I mean, the people that I coach typically are, are competing two, maybe three times a year, but still, so about still about the same. Two. Yeah, yeah, so about the same. Yeah. So it's, I don't know. I don't know. It's, that's the hardest thing for me to manage is like, uh, emotions and, you know, getting people to understand that like one bad workout, um, it's okay. Like it's, yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's literally it's okay. Expected, right? <laughs> right? It's expected. Yeah. If every workout was perfect and, and if every workout you just like made tremendous progress, like the sky would be the limit, you know, like it would, you've got to like have those moments where it's not perfect just to build your mental capacity, but also to, to problem solve and figure out like, you know, that's when we figure out like, okay, this is what we need to change or add in or take out or, um, to kind of take a look at like what's going on in your personal life. Are you sleeping enough? Are you hydrated? Are you eating right? Um, what's your conditioning? Like there's so many aspects I think that people don't look at. There's, you know, a little bit less personal accountability. It's more like if I have a bad day, then it's, you know, what's wrong with the program or, you know, I, I'm always just like me as a coach, I'm always just feel like I'm on the chopping block. Cause I'm like, if someone has a bad day, like that's it, I'm fired. You yeah. know, <laughs> if, if I was to guess just <laughs> being a part of this for so long is I never even heard of this meat prep philosophy yeah, yeah, yeah. until I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, right. it was just, you competed. Yeah. Where it, you had Circumax, it, you just did like a little deload Circumax and then yeah. into the meat. Where yeah. it's, I can see psychologically, if you're in meat prep, then you're probably going to make sure you're sleeping, you're yeah. eating, you're all these other things. Right. Then if you're not in meat prep, well, then what the fuck? I'm just whatever. Yeah. And then, so I can see that mentally playing yeah. this whole role. It's like, cause it, at first I had like, what are you talking about? Like, it's because like, bodybuilders i got that yeah. you start dieting yeah. and stuff like what the fuck is a powerlifting meat pro i don't understand right and then i started to get it when but i then i fell back to oh so you're doing linear right because then that would start <laughs> with the eights you know 14 weeks out or whatever yeah. it is well no i'm like well then it's all meat prep. Yeah. Like actually, yeah, I mean, really that's what even like when I do meat prep for people, it's literally, there's really not a lot of difference in off season training. It's just the, I pick out specific max effort variations that are like testers. They're not a builder. It's like a tester to see, you know, you're going to get in your full gear, you know, typically it's like the same ones that we only typically hit in meat prep just to kind of see like, well, last time in me prep, I hit this. So this time I hit that, it gives people a lot of confidence. Like, I mean, obviously it sucks if they don't hit a, you know, hit a PR and it's like, they're thinking, oh my gosh, that means I'm not going to be ready for the meet, but we can usually identify like what the problem was. It might be technical or, you know, some outside environmental factors, but that's the only difference is like, we're picking out specific max effort movements that are our testers and not the builders. The, the way that I've tried to explain it is if wherever their prep starts, right. 10 weeks, five, who, who knows, yeah. right? So let's say their prep starts at 12 weeks. And then I say that's, that's your starting gate. So the whole off season is to get you back to the starting gate healthier mm -hmm. than you were the last time you were there. Right. So you don't necessarily have to be as 
strong as what the meat was, yeah. but you need to be as healthy and in the best condition, everything that you can be there to be able, because there's only so many variables you can train 12 weeks out. Yeah. Because you're, you're, you're building strength and peaking strength. The biggest changes happen in that off season. Right. Right. To yeah. where, you know, you don't want to accumulate a damage from meat to yeah. meat to meat to meat to meat. Yeah. So while they don't want to train their, their, their ability to recover, to rest, whatever they fucked up, yeah. you know, injury wise, all the, get all their other life shit in order, all the other stuff can, so when that starts, maybe there's, if they're within, I think what Louie used to tell me is if you can be at 90%, yeah. you know, at whatever weeks out, then you're right where you need yeah. to be. If you're under that, you got a problem. Yeah, for sure. So, then there's like, okay, something yeah. might be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, you that that meant that whole off season though meant you couldn't fall less yeah. than ten percent. But it also told me I can fall. Yeah. Ten percent. Yeah. Give yourself some grace, like you know. Yeah, but I mean, that's a hard thing for people to understand nowadays. Is like, yes, this is meat prep. Um, these are exercises you've done before, but if you don't make like a PR does not mean that you're not going to have a great meet. Cause how many times hmm. I, mean, I had horrible preps, like, you know, or like horrible time leading up and I thought, oh, this is going to be terrible. And I did great. And then I've had, um, preps leading up to a meet where I had, everything was so good. And then I don't know what happened that day. I bombed out in the squat, you know? So you just never know. Like, you know, it's like you said, it's more about staying healthy, recovering and, and going into the meat injury free and, uh, and getting out of the meat injury free, you know? With, um, I want to go back to Leah because something you said earlier was, you know, the, the guys that you see don't recover as well as what the women do. And there's probably many reasons for that. But one of the things I've always thought is they don't have as much weight, you know, on their yeah. spine, yeah, you know, yeah. accumulating all that nervous system damage or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it. Well, she does. Yeah. Right. So as her, as her squats gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, has her ability to recover from those heavy sessions become harder? Uh, in a way. Yeah. There, I definitely, like I said, like it was a good thing she was in person cause we could kind of regulate yeah. on the fly. It's like, okay. Um, especially in the off season, it's like, you need more re uh, rest. And, and for her, it was like her off season leading up to this, the prep for, the pro-am was what well, she did a lot more raw stuff. She just did a lot more, um, reps on deadlift and she just gotten like better shape, you know, and, and, and that helped a lot. It helped her to be able to do the prep like normal. And, um, she did mostly, I mean, everything like, like everybody would do. And she did all our speed work. Um, her special exercise days were mostly focused on just what do I need to recover? It might be like literally sleep, you know, cause she has a regular job. She's a nurse, mm -hmm. you know, so she needs a lot more rest, but yet you're right. It, she is more like her training is more like the guys. It's like, okay, we needed to add in a lot more rest and recovery. And there might be days where it's just like, it, it is not a good day. Just stay home, you know, mm -hmm. on a speed bench day or something like that. Um, but for the most part, she was able to do mostly everything in prep, you know, every, all the four days, just as they were, she got in her gear, did, you know, reverse band squats. She did squats with chains, um, did the reverse micro mini band squat. The biggest thing that was different is that we didn't worry about hitting a PR. It was just like this, we need to just hit this number. Yes. In the past you did, um, a top load with the chains of a 10, 10, 50 or something. You don't need to do that. You know, like you're trying to squat 935. We don't need a top load of 1050. So we, we cut back a lot more on, on what she needed to do. So they weren't PRs, but in, it resulted in coming in with the biggest squat she's ever done. So then going into the next off season, you got more buy-in with her. As far as the conditioning and all the other stuff to be able to get ready for the next time around. Oh yeah. She, I mean, she's a hundred percent, you know, conjugate West side conjugate training. And she has since, um, picked up a job as the strength coach for the Norwood football team in Cincinnati. And so she's like learned a ton. So it's, it's, it's nice to, you know, doing this, but I also am trying to have an impact on people that are coming in to help, you know, I can't, I'm you know, I'm only going to be able to do this forever, or, you know, for so yeah, long, yeah. you know, so it's like, you know, the people that are coming up, like she's now passing it on. Like she's working with football players, but also coaching other, and she started coaching some people online and, you know, doing it how we do it, you know? So that's, that's pretty cool that like she saw the benefit, she, you know, reaped the the benefits from it and now is passing along to other people, athletes and power lifters. Now, when you're working with people 
and and house, you know, mm-hmm. so they're always they're always showing up. So I mean, there's that thing. So assuming they always are always there, yeah. always showing yeah, up, yeah. which is not always everybody, but right. <clears throat> assuming that they are, <laughs> what are the pivots or the audibles that you find that you have to make with them most often? Like, what do you mean? If you got to back them down, so if they're oh, yeah. you know, if got back, back, back them down. I assume it's probably going to be that with yeah, the definitely s- stronger it's, ones. You know, it, like knowing when to say like today's, you know, we need to adjust today. And like I said, it might be like literally not doing the main movement at all or saying like, we're only going to work up to this. Like, I'm not like, you can tell like when you're working with someone it's like, it's, that is not going to be there today. I just, you know, so rather than them working up and missing and having a bad mental day, it's like, no, let's just work up to this, move on to accessories. I don't, you know, we do not need to worry about this today. We need to focus more on accessory work. So it depends on if they're in off season or, or close to a meet or something like that. Um, but yeah, just being able to shift, shift those things, you know, in person is yeah, really what's, important. What's one way you can tell, I don't want you to mention more than one yeah. way because you don't want them to know all your ways, yeah. <laughs> but what's one way that you can tell that they're, they're not going to be able to handle what's optimally program for them to be able to um, not optimally is a bad word what's programmed for them to do yeah well usually it's like if they're working up in the in their warm-up sets and they're you know on that fifth or sixth set and it is moving slow and i and you just know after yeah. you've been doing this a while you know like this is not going to be good today so let's like shift and just in and that might be upsetting to them. They might be like, you know, because everybody loves to max out. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, usually it's on max effort days. On dynamic effort days, they're okay with me saying like, you know, that's moving slow, drop the weight. You know, that's totally fine. But on max effort days, you know, it, they feel like like it's a failed day if if we're not going to actually hit that one rep max or or have to like adjust it for whatever reason. So usually just visually you can see if someone's, you know, if you've been doing this long enough, you can see like, this is not going to be a good day. So if you pull that back, do you pull the accessories back as well? Or just that main thing? Usually just that main thing, you know, like let's just work on accessories today. And if someone's having pain, that's a different thing. That's a totally different thing. Like that might be, we're going to totally change accessories today, or we need to work on, you know, you need to go see this person, that person. Like, cause I'm, you know, back in the day, it was just like, okay, if you're the coach, you have to know everything. Now I am so happy that there's so many experts and things. It's like, nobody's coming to me for a diet. I'm like, I'll send you to this person or, you know, one of the athletes that I trained, Sarah Buckley, she's, um, you know, got all these certifications in FRC, FRS, FRA, um, you know, trained under or learned under, um, John Quint. So it's like, we have a really good mobility specialist Mm -hmm. now in-house, you know, and she's doing a lot with working with people for conjugate mobility. So working specifically with people that do this training system, but need to, you know, because I don't know, back in the day, it was like, if I felt like I needed to, work on my hip mobility. I just like did the most standard gymnastic stretching, you know, it's like Mm -hmm. now we know a little bit more, you know, and it's a little bit more involved than just stretching your muscles. You know, it's, this is more joint mobility and, um, you know, so it's, it might be something like that. It might be like, you need to stop because you're going to hurt yourself. You know, you need to take the next six weeks and, you know, we need to modify some things and need to work, work with Sarah or, you know, on, on this mobility work, you know, because you're not going to make any more progress if you can't open, open your hips. Like it's, you know, so things like that. How have you had to change for the raw lifters that you work with? Change what? Your temp, the, the in-house template, right? Yeah. So not, not that yeah, basic yeah. template, but now you're working with them in person. Yeah. So what changes there is there, obviously there's less box squats. You already said that. Yeah. Um, or the box squats are being implemented. To, yeah. They're just, being, uh, how are they being implemented? Well, so like with Alex, for instance, she will do on max effort lower day. It's mostly squatting and good mornings. So it might be you know, a three rep max, good morning with some down sets. Another week might, especially now she's about to do the American pro. And after that, you know, we've got a day of good mornings. Like when she gets back into training, yeah, yeah, a day yeah. of good mornings, we're going to have a day to test her box squat so we can, um, base, you know, her percentages on box squats, you know, going forward in the future. And then she goes into like some squat volume. So, you know, kind of a little bit of like traditional linear progression with max effort thrown in there. So we might have a couple weeks of volume, a week of, um, a max effort variation, 
maybe a week of like, to me, a week of good mornings, like, because you're so limited in how heavy you can go in good mornings to me, it's a little bit like a deload, mm -hmm. you know? So that, that week when we have the good morning, um, the accessories are easy. It might be one or two accessories that are a little bit easier. That week is going to be a lot lighter, you know? Um, it's almost like the deload week. Cause I don't believe in like doing a full week of nothing or mm -hmm. like super easy. We're just going to kind of work that in as a lighter week and then get back into, you know, some volume volume max effort you know on on her on max effort day lower day but then on dynamic effort lower day she's gonna she does mostly box squats she's she's gonna her goal for this meet is a pull 572 which just blows my mind that these raw yeah deadlift numbers i'm like that is just wild to me you know these girls are pulling mid fives to mid sixes now it's it's wild so she does do um all of her pulling um after her box squats on dynamic effort lower day she does um you know some some speed traditional speed work and then sometimes she does again some volume work on on um deadlifts now you you mentioned she's doing the american pro which brought a question to my mm -hmm. mind is how far out are do you have their last heavy lifts um, you know, cause when she came to me, it was wild because she was talking about how heavy she would go literally during the week of the meet. And I was like, and I see that a lot. I'm like, you're doing what on Monday and on Wednesday, what, you know, so she's does it just like we do her, her meat prep is very much like the equipped meat, meat prep. You know, she's no longer doing like squat volume. It's, you know, max efforts, squat variations, reverse bands. She'll do a, a week of chains, um, you know, block pull reverse band deadlifts, you know, she's doing more. Now we're doing like the tester type of stuff. Um, we do kind of keep in some of the volume on deadlifts on her dynamic effort day, you know, we're kind of rotating with speed work, but she's doing a, a pretty classic meat prep that I would have anybody, even an equipped lifter do, and which includes a circumax, you know, we, we deload on that Monday, um, do circumax on Friday. And then um, it just tapers down, it, you know, tapers down into the meat. So the week of the meat is just sled dragging, um, bamboo bar bench, some lap pull downs, band push downs, very, you know, some reverse hypers. It's just blood flow stuff. So it's, I mean, I, I treat it just like I would anybody, you know, so we're not doing a, a squat and bench deadlift opener the week before or the week of the meet or anything yeah. like that. It, 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 after that circumax at 21 or 21 days out, everything starts to taper down. What's your circumax look like? Um, so when I was competing, you know, I did a traditional circumax, um, several times I would do the straps down box squat with tons of band tension, but I was really good at box squatting. Um, so I could do like crazy number on that, but it wasn't really carrying over. It wasn't, it wasn't, that wasn't showing up at the meet. Mm -hmm. So then I, um, started to kind of change and do a free squat. Um, so I did it, I've done it several ways. I've done it with a ton of chain, like a lot of chain, but it was a free squat. Cause to me, it was like circumax is it's a concept. It's a, it's a delayed transformation phase. Yeah. It, it doesn't, nobody said circumax is a box squat, you know, mm -hmm. with straps down. That just is what, you know, Louis did a lot of box squats and a lot of accommodating resistance. Um, so I was like, okay, I can still do a squat, the heaviest squat that I'm gonna do all of prep with that same amount. You know, I usually would do like maybe 40 ish percent of chain weight. Um, but free squat knees wrapped, everything, um, would be my 21 days out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, now I kind of have people, sometimes I'll have lifters do that or I'll have them do a reverse, reverse micro mini band squat. Cause it really, the reverse micros might give you a little pop out of the hole, but it's more of like a free weight squat without doing a free weight squat. But I'll have people do that and do all of their meat attempts. Um, you know, all three meat attempts, but with the reverse micros, um, just like the, what they're planning on doing in, in the competition. It gives them a little bit of, you know, confidence that, you know, these micros really aren't doing a ton. Yeah. Um, but it gives them confidence that like, this is what I'm planning on doing at the meet that felt good. Um, we're doing it free squat with commands, meet commands, everything like that. It makes them feel confident. Cause you know, with conjugate people are like, well, how do I know how strong I'm going to be? Yeah. You know, it's like, well, okay, here you go. Here's your opportunity to kind of, to, to somewhat do that, you know, before the meet. You use more chains for that or that one, bands? Um, that one was like, if I'm having them do all their meat attempts, it's with reverse. Yeah, um, yeah, micro that's reverse. Minis. Yeah. yeah, reverse bands. But, you know, some people I'll have, you know, if I, depending on the person, I'll have them do um, against chains. So like it could be, like I said, around 40 to 45% 
chains if you have enough chains for that because some sure. people if you're in a thousand pound squatter do you have four thousand or four hundred yeah, yeah. pounds of chain you know um it's it's a lot so it might not be quite as much but it's definitely an increase of the amount of accommodating res resistance than they normally do like if you know if you usually do a squat in training if it's like a um some sort of squat variation you're doing 120 pounds of chain we're probably going to do 240 you know for a circ max any do you use bands you know against bands for any of that i don't typically because that you know, that over speed eccentrics is hard for max effort. It's really hard. Um, you know, we, that's not to say we don't sometimes do that mm -hmm. as, um, a max effort variation in the, in the off season, but I typically don't do that full gear. Um, you know, I just think it's, it can be a little, I don't want to say dangerous, but you know, I think it's better for speed squats on a box. So now while you're running that circa max and that's done on the max effort day, what's being done well, max would be on this, dynamic so day. what's done on the max effort day while that phase is going on well that week like prior to um the circumax on friday on dynamic effort day is just a deload because mm -hmm. you're just preparing for that day um then the monday after you did circumax is a deadlift opener so i mean really yeah. working up to deadlift mm -hmm. opener shouldn't you know if you're picking a proper deadlift opener it shouldn't be taxing it should be work up be done um, and then go into your accessory work. And then that Friday, that's week two of Circumax is typically like working out to maybe 80% of your, um, of what you did the week before. So we're keeping it the same. If you're doing chains or if you're doing reverse micros, it's the same setup. You're just working up to 80% of, um, what you hit of bar weight, what you hit the week before. And then week three, um, which is one week before the meet is typically, I mean, you might do like 50 to 60%, you know, just in briefs, three sets of three, or sometimes I'll just have people do uh, belt squats that week, you know, really that you're not going to get any stronger that day, Yeah, yeah. you know, so what you do that day isn't necessarily, the, the variation isn't necessarily important. It's just that you don't do too much. So, um, that's kind of week three is it's such a very, very easy day. And then the week of the meet is just blood flow work. Okay. I'm not yeah. a, the pivot topics, the, your your last pro am was 10 years of pro ams, right? Yeah, it would have. Well, actually, no, this this one in April was 11. So it, was it would have been 12, but we missed yeah, 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> why did you do the first one? So what was the motivation for that? Um, I had become friends with Kara Weston. She was she trained out at super training in California at Mark Bell's gym. And she actually started a women's pro am out there. Um, and I went out there and I I did her meet. This was probably, this was obviously before I did, started doing the pro-ams. So I don't know what year that was, um, but I went out there. I mean, if I started the pro-am in 2012, then, um, yeah, it had to have been in 2010 or 2011. I went there to do, to her meet, to do her meet. And then the following year I went out there and just went, helped her with it. And that's when I was like, all right, I'm going to host this out there. We, we were, the plan was to have hers in like a, uh, or in the fall she was did hers in like november and then i was going to do the one in april um over time like you know obviously mark bell moved out of that gym you know she just kind of stopped running that one out there it was just it was harder for her out in california because it, it just wasn't as popular mm -hmm. especially in northern california powerlifting um wasn't so um i started i had in 2012 the women's pro-am in cincinnati and i was just like i don't know how many people are going to do this because there weren't that still weren't that many women in powerlifting so i thought okay, how many people are going to sign up? And we ended up having like 43, which was huge. I mean, back then it was, you know, if I went to a, a, a meet, I might yeah. be one of a few women that did the meet. So we, I remember it was pouring down rain that day. We had moved everything out of the sweatshop and it, it was only a 3000 square foot room, moved everything out of there, had, had the meet that day. And, and that day, that intensity and that environment that day was the same as it was this year, you know, that's when it was created. I was just like, this is wild. I remember like Josh Connolly and some of the guys that were training at Westside at the time came and they were like, we've never seen any, like that felt anything like this. I mean, it didn't look anything great. It wasn't, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think we had a karaoke microphone. We just didn't have much. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the intensity and that energy that the women brought that day, I was like, this is unreal. And then the year after that we had expanded into the other side. And so the space grew and I was worried. I was like, well, I don't know how good it's going to be because we're not all packed in together. I thought that was what it was. It was just mm -hmm. like packed in together, but, um, having it, you know, grow in size as far as the, the building was, um, everything was still the same and it's still been the same to this day. 
I even worried this year when we moved into the um, fairgrounds, I was like, oh, this is a big room. I don't know how we're going to fill this with intensity and energy. And, and they, the, the women did it, you know? So. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's different. Yeah. Right. So it's, there's, it's not a me that's a, it's a community. Yeah. Right. For sure. And so it's a different, I've been a lot of meets. It's a different meet. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's got like its life of its own. Right. That's, that's kind of hard to explain. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I kind of, you know, I see people be like, do this or do that with me, you know, to kind of make it more glitzy and glamorous, like some of these bigger raw meats. And I'm like, I know what that costs. I don't have any sponsors trying to show up to be like, um, we want to pay for, you know, this giant screen in the back, or we want to pay for this or that. I was like, no, that comes from entry fees and the, the sponsors that we do have are, are giving cash and I want that cash to go to the lifters. I don't yeah. want to pay for some big screen behind, you know, like I want it to look great. I just want the experience to be really good. I want to have good judges, sort of a good atmosphere, good venue. Um, and you know, we've got a good live stream. I think we've got a good thing going as far as the growth of it. Um, I think people kind of like that it's, it's evolved and it's like a, like a really awesome like looking experience but it's still got that feel of how it used to be back in the day you know the, the community, that feel, community feel which yeah. it's just like <clears throat> a reunion yeah absolutely type of thing. yeah and people know the the women know they're like this is what i've done this before or i've been there to watch it or i've watched it on the live stream i know what that energy is so they know that they want to bring that same thing so it's just like a kind of like an unspoken thing like if you're going to show up it, like this is like a community. Everybody's cheering for each other. This is not cutthroat. Like it's everybody's actually, they want to see you do the best that you can do on the platform, you know, and, and that kind of seeing that support from the other lifters kind of brings the crowd into it too. You know, they get really into it. And next thing you know, it's just like, it's just, you can just feel that intensity in the air. One of the, one of the questions that was suggested I asked was, um, God, how did they word this? Uh, me director nightmares. Oh. So, me director nightmares. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, me director nightmare story. See, this is tough because you don't want to mention anybody. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> luckily, like I, I do try to be ultra prepared, like ultra prepared. I mean, I think so. I don't really have anything that comes to mind where it was just like a a total nightmare. You know, I have nightmares. Like leading, I've already <laughs> started having nightmares about like you know, showing up and no one's there to help or, you know, that, cause that is probably my biggest thing. And that's something that's kind of changed with powerlifting too, is that like when, when this meet was smaller or when the other meets that I've hosted were smaller, I had a lot more help, a lot more people like that would just volunteer to spot load and do all that. And it's a little bit different now. It's a little bit harder to find, to find that, you know, so that's kind of like my biggest fear is like not having enough help, you know, and having people show up to help, you know, it's really hard. It's, I would, of course I would love to like pay out all the people that are spotting and loading and doing all that. But, you know, I also know that the people that are volunteer their time to help, they know that like that money, I'm not putting that in my pocket. Like that is literally going back to the lifters, you know? So, um, any way that we can do that. So, I mean, I wish I had a really great nightmare story, but I think that's just to, to, I guess my credit is like, I've tried to be very prepared and and not miss anything that I can think of. I might think of something when we're talking, but. <laughs> <All> right, <words. laughs> Well, it's it's a business too, yeah. right? Where there's always going to be the assumption you're making a million dollars doing it, which isn't true. But <clears throat> you, I believe your mom owned a bakery, right? Yeah. And then you said something in one of the podcasts about your, the, where there's a restaurant too. Yeah. My uncle has a restaurant. Yeah, has a restaurant, yeah. right? So you grew up in an entrepreneur mm -hmm. life, right? And then after college, or you worked at Bob Evans through Ohio State, Did, right? Yeah. Sorry to hear Gosh, that. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> uh, you're really sorry to hear that. But <clears throat> then after that, you know, worked for GM for just a little bit, mm -hmm. but basically have been working for yourself yeah, for the past, most yeah. almost all your life, yeah. right? So was that entrepreneur spirit or drive instilled when you were growing up? Yeah. Cause even, cause my mom didn't 
start the bakery or start selling her cookies until I was in college. So, but even when we were growing up, she was a stay at home mom. There's four of us girls and she always was doing something to make money. Like, you know, I mean, there's four girls, but she was still like, she would sew curtains, these big like window treatments for people. Um, she would, everybody knew she was a great cook. She's Italian. She would make, do like some catering stuff for people. She was always so creative. And so, um, she had just always had that kind of mindset, you know, and was so good at it. And she was so personable with people, 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 her cookies are the best, but, um, they also just love talking to her, you mm -hmm. know? And so I was just like, and she was very generous and, you know, was doing it truly to like make a difference and like in people's lives and not to just like make a, make a ton of money, you know? So I think that's kind of like what I've taken from that and from Louie too, was just like, is just giving it back to people. I could probably make a lot more money if I was a lot, you know, more of a stickler about pay me this, pay me that, you know, but I just, um, I don't know. I just wanted to help people. Well, it's a different life path yeah. though too, right? Yeah. Because everybody assumes, you know, obviously you make more than you do. Yeah. And there's, I say there's being an entrepreneur is like getting your face smashed in with a mallet 20, <laughs> 22 hours of every day. Right. Right. And then there's two hours that are like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Where, and you always are thinking that the grass is greener on the other side, but you don't want to try. I know. Right. So it's what you're in it now. I mean, when you're in it long enough, it's just like, fuck it. This is what I'm just going to yeah. do. I'm going to ride or die. Right. But it's not easy. Yeah. Right. It's not easy. No. And it's especially on online today, everybody's, you know, talking about, you know, how they can make a million dollars. I mean, this entrepreneur and okay. you're like, uh, not really. I know it, it gets me thinking. I'm like, where am I going? Cause like, I mean, I literally know people who are teenagers that do one meet and then they start coaching people. I mean, that is not a meme. That is truly what people are doing. Yeah. And I'm just like, I mean, the way this is going, I'm like, do I need to think about like a exit plan, like to, something else to do? Like, you know, am I just going to get like kind of gone by the wayside? You know, I, I, I start to think this thing. I'm like, am I have a midlife crisis? Like, you know, what's wrong? Why am I thinking that? Like, but it's true. Things are changing a lot. So I'm just like holding on for dear life. I'm like, I'm, this is what I do. I'm not bending. I'm not going to like change to the role culture, you know, like I'm, you know, this is what I do. And, you know, if people still like that in 20 years, then. Well, awesome. my question back to you would be those paranoid <laughs> thoughts have probably been there since day oh, yeah. one. Yeah. They're not going to go away. Yeah. yeah. If they don't go, it's just part of, it's part of it. And it's, um, I have them all the, all the time. Yeah. Same thing. Like, fuck, like, some, you know, like some days I'm done. Yeah. Like well, I can't be done. Like, yeah. Cause you it know? never turns off. It, it, it could be a Sunday, like, which is, should be a day to just like chill. And it's like, message, 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 message. It's just like, oh my gosh, I, I don't have a day off. Like, even if I want to take a vacation or whatever, it's, it doesn't stop people from, from needing, you know, needing things and ne having questions and, you know, it never really stops. So then I'm always just like, what would it be like to just like go to work? My husband is a lineman. And I'm like, I am sometimes I'm so envious of you because you literally go to work at 7 a.m. at 3 30, you're done, mm -hmm. you know, and on the weekend at 3 30, you are done until Monday, you know, it's just like, wow, you know, sometimes, but then I'm like, I can never do anything else, you know, this, mm -hmm. is, this is what I do. No, I, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I know, I yeah. completely understand where it's frustrating as hell, but the rewards are high, right? So right. it's, it's kind of like training. Most of the training kind of actually kind of sucks if yeah. you think about it. Yeah. The the fun stuff, like the maxing out and the things oh, that you're yeah. talking about, and then you have somebody tell you not to do it today, that would suck, right? right. But most of the training sucks because mm -hmm. it's like the sled dragging, the accessory yeah, work. Yeah, it's not fun. It's not glamorous. Boring <laughs> crap, right? The only stuff that's really fun are just small yeah. little pieces. Yeah. Businesses like that, unfortunately, <laughs> but it is what it is where I like to just have conversation with people that like the reality of it. Yeah. So other people don't get this false reality yeah. of what it really is. Yeah. You know, it's not what they think. Definitely. And for a lot of people, I, I, I probably talk more people out of it yeah. <laughs> than I do, you know, into it. Yeah. Because it's it's not what they think. No, it's really hard. It's like a hustle constantly. Like I don't have a steady paycheck. Like I mean, I don't, I don't know what I'm gonna make this month, next next month. You know, it's like you just you're just it's just a constant hustle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's something else. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like I don't know what I'm gonna do, but 
I'm having fun. <laughs> See, my, my backup plan was if it, if it all goes south, I can just go work as a trainer for J.L. Holsworth. But yeah. if he sells his place, I'm fucked. Yeah, yeah. You know, so then it's... <laughs> that is one good thing is I do personal training for like everyday people and... um you know, so I used to do so much more of it, like before the online training was, took up so much of my time. Um, you know, now it's more like part-time. So I'm like, I could always just like bump that up more if like, if the, if this online training gets like too out of control. You mm -hmm. know, what has it been, person. how has it been building that? Because you started doing that before it was really a thing. The online training, um, it's, I, I you know, I, I have a website and, you know, my sister helps me with my, my team QBP Instagram page, like, cause I'm just not good at that kind of stuff. But so she does that. And so she'll like do make posts to like promote that. If she didn't do that, I probably, gosh, like, I don't who knows where I'd be at right now because I'm just not good at that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like being like, Hey, like, um, sign, you know, to come train, you know, train with me online, you know, it's really, it's really hard. So I just kind of, it's a lot of, it's just like word of mouth and, you know, I go and teach us seminars and talk about it. So a lot of it's just like referral based and, and, you know, I'm not out there like paying to advertise and, and, and things like that. It's just more of like, just kind of word of mouth as far as the online training goes. And you're still doing the seminars now. Yeah. Yeah. Not, I mean, maybe like three or four a year. So I'll be going to um, Deuce Gym in California in November will be my next one, but I don't really have anything on the books um, after that. My the, my friend Sarah that I was talking about that does the conjugate mobility, we've kind of teamed up and started doing some seminars, you know, so we'll probably do, you know, one or two next year, you know, because it's just like a good compliment to each other. It's like, okay, here, learn about the West side conjugate system here, learn about mobility and how you should in, in, integrate that into your training, you know? Um, so that's been like a good kind of partnership as far as doing a seminar with someone else, you know, because I, that's the number one thing people ask me is like, well, you know, if this is tight and I can see that it's like, I don't really have the knowledge and expertise to tell you, this is what you should do for mobility. But now it's like, here you yeah, go, yeah. you know, like, um, cause that's a, a huge thing that people are, are missing in their training. And, um, you know, I'm guilty of that. My whole powerlifting career, I didn't really do much of anything for mobility. And I was yeah. just fortunate that I made it through, but some people it's like most people, um, need that. And they're as part of their training, not just like when something goes wrong, you know, like why not just do a little bit a little bit throughout your training uh, to prevent prevent those things from happening. That can help a lot though too if you're because what you do are basically technique seminars, yeah. right? So a lot of times that technique's being compromised because of that, where there's ways you can hack around it, which I'm sure you've figured yeah. out. But you kind of know that issue's still gonna be there. Yeah. You know, there's once only so you many leave. cues you can give someone, you know, yeah. knees out, you know, you know, they might not even as much as they could try as hard as they possibly could, they just cannot physically get that, get that to happen. And then it's like, okay, now you need, you need to address that. Yeah. Have there been any seminars that you've went to do? I, 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 I had, I have the question, right. But <laughs> the answer sometimes can, I don't like calling shit out yeah. that, that you, and that you, went to do, but then you're like, oh my God, this place is not what I thought it was without um, mentioning the place. Right, right. One, one time I, I, I'll give you an example. Yeah. One time I did one in the, um, the squat session. Where I thought this was going to be a gym, yeah. right? It had a gym name. Yeah. The squat session was in a one car garage and the bench session was in a freaking bomb shelter. Oh that you couldn't gosh. stand what well, you could, I couldn't yeah. stand all the way up in. Right. But that's why that's where all the bench stuff was because yeah. you never had to stand up anyhow because yeah, yeah. you're laying down. Now I thought it was going to be like a freaking gold a gym, gym. Yeah. Right. And it's like, ugh, you ever run into things like that? Not as much because I probably because of social media. So you can see, oh, you can see, yeah, I you can, can yeah. see right yeah, there what yeah. it's going to be like. So there's no surprises. Yeah. Um, but I've definitely had uh, seminars where I'm thinking like, man, these people are not talking, not asking questions. I, they're, they are not liking this. And then afterwards, like, that was incredible. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> because like, you know, you didn't say a single word. Um, but as far as, you know, the gym itself, yeah, no, I can usually see. Um, and I don't, like I said, I don't do as many anymore, so I can really like make sure that I'm going to a place that, um, it seems like that the host is actually going to promote it, you know, and, and, um, people are going to show up. I think it also helps to keep your, um, your tools sharp. Yeah. Right. Because it's, I mean, I can imagine what the CrossFit ones were like, but yeah. oh my God, you know, but you, it, 
you're used to seeing the demographic you work with. Right, right. But then you'll go into a different state or a different gym and all of a sudden, oh, whoa. Yeah. There could be a power lifter in the gym there could, or in the seminar and there could be, you know, a totally different, just a, a person that might go to that gym who's just an everyday person, you know? So it definitely, like you said, keeps your tool sharp because you're working with all different ranges of people. So, and it helps me too, to, to verbalize and to talk about the system and, you know, to keep that fresh in my mind and, um, you know, how can I improve it every single time that I do it? And, you know, I'm still learning more and passing that on and, um, you know, working with people of all different populations is super helpful. Well, I can tell that you've worked with a lot of people from yeah. different populations because when I look at your YouTube videos or any of the videos that you do that you're demonstrating a movement, the cues that are you're, you're using yeah. are cues, like I know what other people would say if they didn't work with people. Yeah, yeah. Right? right. The cues are at a level that everybody can understand yeah. because I can tell you've done the cues in other ways and had to not do them that Definitely. way anymore. Yeah. Like you can't use like big fancy words. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like literally just keep it as simple as possible you mm -hmm. know, so that people can understand and get the most out of it. You know, I think that's a problem sometimes people will do is they try to use like big words and, you know, this and that. And it's like, people are just like, you know, they're not hearing that. <laughs> no, no, they're yeah. not. But it's interesting though, because you've been yeah. around long enough to kind of see right. it. Definitely. You know, where, I mean, and, you know, yeah. with Louie, it was just like everything he would say was so scientific and stuff. And you just see people like, what, you know? And so it would be like AJ, Shane and I just like trying to, okay, this is what he meant, you know? Yeah. <laughs> in, in Louie's defense though, that was, that was him. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. He, was he wasn't not trying to try to dumb yeah. it down. No, this is, you know, so it was like, it was good that people heard that and they should. I don't know if he knew that. how to dumb it down, yeah, right? Because no. he would look to other people to say, can you explain this yeah, to them? Yeah, yeah. You know, so he knew when it wasn't getting through, right. you know, to be able to get it through with other people. Oh, it's yeah. just, it's the genius in his brain just worked different. Yeah, definitely. 100% he worked <laughs> different. And, um, but he needed to have those people to, dumb it down, right. I guess, or right. to better, better explain it. Yeah. Just it so way. people can stay interested. You don't want to lose people by them being like, I just don't get this, you know? Yeah. So I, you know, that, that's kind of what kind of also, you know, when it kind of drove me to keep doing this because like people will read the books, they'll read the book of methods, they'll read all of, all of Louis, Louis books and recommended books. And they're like, I mean, I I'm reading this. I just don't know how to put it together. And it's like, let me do this you know, just to give you a, a rundown of how to put this together um, and to give people an option to, you know, for a, a cheap way to, to put into practice with the subscription, yeah. you know, it's mm -hmm. like, um, you don't need to pay me, you know, a bunch of money to do individualized thing. Try this first. Cause it's super well-rounded. Like what I put on there on the subscription site is very well-rounded. Like everybody should get stronger at some point then. Yeah. Then we might need to like, to, kind of like adapt it for you. But for the most part, it's, it's not missing any ingredients. You know, the West side conjugate system is got recovery, you know, max effort, dynamic effort, repetition, effort, uh, effort method all in one week, you know, and if you're doing it properly, like I talked about with the not overdoing the volume on max effort day or dynamic effort day, there really is no need to have like a deload week. Cause everybody, people will say that like, well, when's my deload week? It's like, well, you sh if you're doing everything right, that's not to say that you might have other factors in your life with stress and things like that, that might force you to need to take an easier week. But, um, well, we're on the same page. Be, you have no yeah. idea how much shit I've gotten for saying things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Where I'll say, well, you know, those usually happen around Thanksgiving, yeah. Christmas, <laughs> yeah. you know, a birthday, you get sick. Right. You know, if you right. look at every unintentional deload that yeah, happens, totally. Yeah. There's, there's already plenty of time. Yeah already built in totally yeah no i've yeah you don't I've need been, to have I, yeah. like a yeah like oh after the third week of the squat wave do you to take a deload and no 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 well you are because you're going back down the, the week one exactly yeah. yes <laughs> yeah. that was my point like if it's a three-week wave then from week three to week one right. is what that is a big drop in weight so, it's a deload yeah. <laughs> yeah, right you know so it, yeah. now if you're using block or some other type of you know methodology I then yeah do. it's still going to be programmed into that anyhow right. right you know so it's i just yeah anyhow i'll, I'll <laughs> pivot on that were there any topics that you wanted to go over that i didn't cover i don't think so i mean really my my big thing for the year i i've kind of weeded it down to just a pro-am every year now because i was back in the day i would host a bench press meet and then Louis talked me into hosting the, um, this, 
a meet in February, like, you know, so uh, uh, we'd have a meet in February, then we'd have the North of the Border, then the Pro-Am, you know, so it was like four meets a year. And like, now I'm down to just, I, you know, I just handed over the North of the Border to Leah. So she's gonna be hosting that um, on November 11th. So that's been kind of nice to kind of be like, okay, like you, you've been, she does the main event project and she's doing so much for, for the sport. It's like, you know, why don't you try your hand at hosting a meet? You know, it's, it's a, it's a good experience and, you know, but I just need my efforts to go into the pro-am, you know, so the, um, registration should be, I'm working with my web guy. The registration should be coming, um, probably November 12th. Hopefully I will definitely, so soon. yeah, soon. I'll definitely be posting the exact date, but my goal is November 12th. It's usually sometime right around then anyway, to open up registration and it goes super fast. So, um, that'll be at women's power weekend.com. Usually when the registration opens, usually the, um, amateur day, especially usually sells out and less than five minutes. Um, so it's just like, man, I remember when it would sell out and then we moved it to two days. It was one day for a while. And then we moved it to two days. And now I'm like, it just makes me feel so bad that anybody could not make it in. But, you know, even last year we had like a waiting list. It was, I don't know, we had maybe like 10 people on the waiting list. And most of those people got on because, you know, from November to April, things happen with people, sure. injuries, yeah. things like that. So um, for most of the people got, got on. So that made me happy. So so it's the best place for people to reach you. I'm going to assume it's your website. Yeah, the clean, it's not clean, the Instagram, yeah, yeah, by the way. I found yeah, that. Out. I know, I know. That is the website. I, I my Instagram. I'm just like, you know, I, sometimes I'll post something and then I walk away. Like, yeah. you know, I feel bad. Like, I would love to like respond to every comment, and and I'm always I want to see people do that. I'm I'm like, how do you, how do you have time for that? You know, um, but it's usually I just post something and then I'm and then You're I'm doing out. It you know, the right and, way. Yeah. So I'm like, trust me. <laughs> and if actually like if you message my um team qbp instagram page my sister helps and she runs that so if there's important message there she tells me she's like hey like, like, you need to answer this message over here um and then but but truly the queenbepower.com um has links to the subscriptions or the uh, individualized programming and then um a, a way to contact me so i get that as an email so okay yeah yes that's, we'll have a link in the description yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know use that trust right, me guys right. use that um <laughs> Any final thoughts? I don't think so. I appreciate this has been super good. I still to this day get nervous about doing podcasts because I'm like, like I have no, there's nothing interesting about me. What am I going to talk what about? What are you talking about? We I know, just... I know. But that's just that, that you know how we were talking about that. Yeah. That's just me. I'm just like, oh, you know, I don't know. Like I should be doing something else. But like, no, I really appreciate it. This has been super fun. No, what you're doing is awesome. What Thank you're doing you. from the sport is awesome. What you did in the sport is awesome. Thank and what you're you. doing from women's powerlifting is unparalleled. Thank you. You know, it's, so it's, it's been my, my goal and, you know, not along with like paying it forward for Louis, but also just growing the sport of women's powerlifting, powerlifting in general. But for some reason, you know, I just do have a special place in my heart for women's powerlifting. Well, look at where it's yeah. gone since you've yeah. came in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's unbelievable. Thank you. I'd love to say it's all because of you, but yeah. we wouldn't know that's all not there's, true. But yeah, there's a lot of You reasons. are a big part of it, yeah. though. There's no doubt about thank that. Thank you. So thank you for coming out. Thank and guys, so we're done. <laughs> This is Dave Tate from Elite FTS. Last year, we partnered with Ken Kanak and to co-host the Swiss Symposium. It's built on hypertrophy and sport medicine for strength athletes and practitioners to come together in one place, which will be the Columbus Hilton at Easton. You are going to learn how to level up your training based upon the success and failures of others. You have to stay on top of your game if you want to be able to make the success and move forward at the pace that you want. Just to name a few of the presenters that that will be presenting. We're going to have Matt Winnie, Brian Carroll, Eric Serrano, Jim Wendler. That's just a few. These experts will be presenting on low back injury and prevention, exercise selection, as well as a business steroid recovery and restoration panel. If you want to network with one of the experts that we have presenting, we're going to have people there to be able to help you do that. To register for the Swiss Symposium, go to the EliteFTS.com website, look for the banner on the home page, click that, and we'll see you there. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking 
everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. One of the ways that you can support the podcast is by purchasing or picking up our limited edition apparel. The shirt that I have on right now is one of the only shirts that we've brought back for a second time. Normally, we'll never do that, but the only reason we brought this one back for a second time is it sold out within six hours. So we brought this one back. We also got a second one that we just dropped. It's our, I guess, just Halloween edition shirt. Go to leadfts.com or go to the link in the description. This really does help us out because this directly supports the Table Talk podcast. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the show. All right, guys, I want to thank today's sponsor, Element. I'm having fun with ads now instead of just trying to like read through all the talking points and so forth. But there's a talking point here I have to read through. Element is a tasty electrolyte drink with everything that you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt and no sugar. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. I've had and have been in the habit of drinking a half a pack before every leg training session and all my cramping issues that I had went away because I've always had cramping issues on heavy leg days and leg days especially. Why do, how, do you, how do your quads cramp doing seated leg curls? But it was a reminder to me that I need element before my heavy training sessions, not just on days when I'm sweating like crazy or it's super hot outside, but there's something with their ratio of sodium, magnesium, and potassium, their scientifically backed ratio, however they explain that, that makes a huge difference with my training. Every morning I mix it in my oatmeal with you know protein and the other crap I mix it with. So I get a half a pack there every morning easy and it actually makes the oatmeal taste better. Head into our description box and click the link that's there for Element or if you're listening to the audio of this, it's D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash table talk. When you go through that link, you'll get a free sample pack of all the different flavors. So maybe you think you might not like the grapefruit. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. Maybe you think you're not going to like the chocolate. I thought it was going to be awful, but it was in the sample pack. And then somebody gave me the idea to throw it in oatmeal. And it was like a game changer to my oatmeal as far as how oatmeal tastes. The sample pack will allow you to test flavors to see what you like and what you don't like. So head over to Element.